and welcome to episode 11 of the Retro Critical Podcast. This is the uh, early October episode. I'm not exactly sure if I can come out with a late October episode. I know I've been away for quite some time. Life is uh, getting a little bit busy, so I may just uh, move back to a monthly schedule with the podcasts, but we'll see. Anyway, I got a, a number of interesting topics. We're going to take you through the latter stages of the Retro League tournament, which has been fairly interesting, and, and, and I think it's come down to a very, very strong Final Four, and we'll kind of go through that. I'm going to talk about uh, some issues with Forza Horizon, both in how it has been marketed and uh, my impressions of the game. We're going to talk about... YouTube Heroes, uh, very briefly, I'm going to talk about, uh, do a little follow-up segment on the advertising insanity on YouTube. This month's hardware update deals with uh, yet another home theater upgrade that I've done and, and kind of its effect on gaming. And believe it or not, I'm going to talk about selling some games. I'm, I don't think you would have expected that from me at this point. But uh, yeah, we'll get into all of that and more here on the Retro Critical Podcast, Episode 11, Let's Go. If you've been listening to the podcast over the past few months, you'll know that I've been kind of negative, kind of down on gaming, and it's uh, you know it's something that's been going on for I would say well you know about a half a year now, especially with the new stuff where I just find I'm I'm more irritated with the direction of modern gaming and just less satisfied with a lot of the the games that I've bought, and I haven't really been purchasing a lot of new stuff, with a couple exceptions here or there, but there's still a couple of games coming out that I was really hyped for, so one of them, and I've mentioned it here before, is Forza Horizon 3. Forza Horizon um, is, is a brilliant concept, and it gets better with each release. So I knew that was coming out at the end of September, I didn't. I wasn't following the the press on it. I wasn't. I just knew it was coming out in September, uh, around September twenty third. So I go to check it out because I, I want to figure out how I can get this cross play uh, ability. I, I assume that I would have to buy it in a digital format. And I, I wanted to buy it, obviously for the PC, and then get the cross capability, cross play capability on the Xbox One, so I'm looking like, okay, the the 23rd, well, uh, the 23rd isn't the, the release date, or uh, better yet, it's one of the release dates. So if you buy the $100 version of the game, the Ultimate Collector's Bundle, you can play the game on the 23rd. Uh, if you can't, I believe you have to wait until the 27th to finally play this game. Now, this strikes me as just a level, another level of completely in, unacceptable and onerous monetization. I mean, how much more can they monetize games? Now, in Forza Horizon, well, Forza and Forza Horizon, they had some pretty devious monetization schemes. Uh, they, they did something with uh, tokens and Forza... Five, obviously, to unlock certain cars uh, throughout all these games. You know, you could always buy the the car packs, and some of the car packs were reasonably priced. But, you know, I know people have had issues with the rate at which you earned currency, and, and they felt that, at least for the first game or two on the Xbox One, that they were kind of 
they've created an economy that sort of made you ultimately want to to buy these cars rather than grind out the credits. That having been said, I think in fairness, as as someone who doesn't really even pay attention to DLC, uh, unless it's a, a really exceptional game, to me I played and enjoyed those games and I didn't feel like I was being gypped out of anything. Yeah, I wasn't getting all the cars, and if I really wanted to complete the collection of everything those games had to offer, I probably would have had to cough up some money. But Forza Horizon 2 was was great. I had a ton of cars. Uh, I didn't pay a dime, and yeah, I found all the, whatever you want to call them, the hidden treasures throughout the map, and you would sort of just drive around and, and come upon them. So it was a great game. And I believe that this is probably going to be a very good game too, but the idea that you would have a completed game and then stagger its release to make, what, 40 more bucks speaks to, a, I think, a new level of crazy monetization. Why wouldn't you just release it at the same day for everyone? Look, you want you got a couple YouTubers in your back pocket, you want to get some press out there, yeah, send out review code. Obviously, that's uh, the way it works for a lot of a lot of games, so I understand that, but to just have to pay an inflated price to play a finished game early, unless, of course, they're going to say, oh, well, we need some last-minute beta testing, so we'll get these suckers to, to pay for the honor of being our beta testers, and that's its own issue. But let's assume that the game is, is in a, a shippable state and is stable, why not release it to everyone so we can all enjoy it at the same time? And it got me thinking, what, you know, can I come up with, whether it's for racing games or other games, other insane ways of monetizing games? And of course, I think the logical extension would be to say, okay, well, if you pay $100, you get it on this date. If you pay, and because and, there's another version of this, it's like the ultimate version, the... Extended version and the standard version. I don't know what the middle version is called. And the middle version doesn't give you early access. But let's say that it did. Okay, you could play it uh, on the twenty, you know, on September twenty third if you if you get the ultimate. And you get the extended version, then you can play it on the twenty seventh. However, if you get the regular version, you'll have to wait until the thirtieth. So, just again, they're they're trying, and I've mentioned this several times now. It's not about selling you a product, it's about monetizing your access to the product. Uh, whether it's just keeping the servers alive, whether it's creating a micro-economy that kind of forces you to pay a little bit more to stay competitive, and all the other instances that I've mentioned over the past couple of months. So how can we take this further? Well, what about controlling access on the other end of the product? Let's say you find it's profitable that eight months in, you can say, well, if you got the ultimate version, you can play this game up until the release of the next Forza. We'll keep some of our servers alive for you. And, you know, if you get the extended version, well, you get uh, ten months out of it. If you get the regular version, you get eight months of full functionality. I mean, it's not crazy. This, this stuff can happen. Take it a step further, and I actually think this next one occurs in some online uh, racing games. What if they charge you for gas and tires? So it's not just, hey, grind out a certain number of credits and you can upgrade to racing tires on your car. No, what if the tires degraded at a certain rate that forced you to pay real money or insane amounts of credits, but real money to upgrade your tires? Or what if, for the pleasure of driving around in this great open world, you actually had to stop off at, at gas stations and pay real money to gas up and, and go? And what if that money was tied to a kind of fluctuating commodities market like oil is tied to? So the developer could say, well, you know, the demand for our in-game resources is such that at these periods the oil is going to be higher and it, or the gas is going to be higher at these periods of digital gas is is going to be lower. Uh, it's and it's completely possible. I want to say that iRacing does that, and you know my hatred for iRacing, not so much uh, as a sort of universal feature of the game, but I, I want to say that if you like for certain leagues, they've instituted that gas policy. Uh, so I mean it can go 
absolutely anywhere. For that matter, when you talk about extending and monetizing access to the game, you could say that, you know, well, if you don't sort of upgrade, and Forza at this point is a yearly game, if, if, if you don't upgrade to the next version after your time with the current version runs out, you can pay us to extend your access to the game. That's a new game, 60 bucks. you want to continue playing. Last year's games can cost you eighteen ninety nine. Now, this next nightmare scenario is kind of a minimal point, I think, for a lot of people, but it would affect me. Uh, a game like Forza uses some degree of online connectivity to sort of put the avatars into the game. It uses some sort of cloud-based AI, which is a really great feature, but for someone like me who doesn't pay for Xbox Live or PlayStation 4, you could actually come up with a situation where even if you didn't want a full subscription, they would charge you a monthly fee or a yearly fee or even a one-time fee to enable that kind of back-end online connectivity that is integral to the game on the basis that, well, you didn't, you're not paying for the online service like other customers. You could have games, for that matter, that say, look, whether... We have a, a specific component of the game that requires online access, or whether we just have this great multiplayer, you're not going to be able to play the game at all in any sort of complete state unless you have an active subscription. Or take it even a step further and say that certain behaviors, in game behaviors, that are detrimental to the online community of a game. Uh, maybe we'll assess micro fines. Like, I was in a racing game. Let's say you are a kind of a, a repeated dirty racer. You know, every race you're crashing into people. You're not even trying to win. Uh, I don't know what, you know, you're a rage quitter in Street Fighter V. Maybe, I don't know what constitutes bad behavior in a shooter, something like that. Let's say you're, you know, speaking all sorts of profanity into your microphone, something like that, that incumbents or, or just, you know, uh, just as a, as a matter of access, you have to set up a credit card account or it's tied to your Xbox account or something like that. And for each infraction, maybe they charge you a dollar here or a dollar there. And then at, at some point, Microsoft will say, hey, look, you know, you incurred these fines, uh, so you've got to pay up or they'll just deduct it from your PayPal. Yeah, I could see it working against someone like me who uh, at certain points spends very little time with a game. Uh, maybe I um, I only want to do a couple races. Maybe in the case of the Forza games, you know, with, with which I'm most familiar, you know, your avatar uh, goes out into the cloud and races other people and, and you can get some credits that way, which is a, a pretty good system. But let's say... I don't level it up enough to be kind of a, a useful piece of AI that they can build into other players' games. I mean, do I pay a fine for that? It seems far-fetched, but at some point, like in the 16-bit era, the Super Nintendo era, could you imagine having a finished, shippable, potentially very popular product and then staggering its release? I mean, for that matter, could you imagine micro-economies, DLC schemes and stuff like that? So, my solution has always been, if you guys want more money, make a great game and charge more money. I, I, I don't... Look, if if they came out with Forza Horizon 3 and said, hey, this is a, a meaningful, extensive upgrade of the previous games, which it looks to be, and to have access to everything, we need, we need to charge you $100, I would have paid $100 for it. Uh, because I got, uh, actually, a lot of playtime out of Forza Horizon 2 to say nothing of the other Forza games. So just make a great game, and if you need $100 per player to turn a profit, charge for it. And again, you may say, oh, well, customers would never accept that. It has to be $60, uh, and customers more easily just sort of will cough up the, the DLC. Okay, you got to tell customers that they're probably paying more in the long run for all of this DLC than, than if they were to just plop down $100. Or how about this? How about you charge people 
hey, it's $100 up front, or it's a yearly subscribe-to-own sort of thing where you pay $10 a month uh, for a year. And, of course, you're going to wind up paying a little bit more, so you're incentivized to pay up front. Do that. I mean, come up with a way to get whatever money you need to get to be a profitable developer, within reason, of course. You're not going to charge $500. But, but just stop dicking players around and monetizing their enjoyment and their time with these schemes that are only going to get worse and worse. So now that I've complained about insane monetization of games, it, it occurred to me that there is actually a solution out there, and it's a, a solution about which I haven't really said all that much. I may have mentioned it here or there, uh, and that is the EA Access model of giving you access to video games. I, I think a way to solve this problem of the developer coming out with a game and then just nickel and diming you to death, would be to actually have a subscription fee. Not per game, but per publisher. And EA Access costs 30 bucks a year. I think it's a, it's a very good deal. And I think I mentioned it with regard to sort of not having to buy even used cheap versions of Madden and NHL hockey and FIFA, which I play with a, a buddy of mine, as, as I mentioned. I mean, there's all, all sorts of stuff on there. There's some games that I, quite frankly, would rather play on PC, whether it's Dragon Age or the new Star Wars game or Titanfall. Uh, all, all the Battlefield games come out on there, and it's, it's a lot of that's not my cup of tea, but I, I, I do try them out from time to time not not you know the battlefields and the need for speed and peggle and uh, all, all those sorts of things not to mention the other kind of lower tier ea sports games which i've had a chance to try so what what, what i realize about ea is that you know with with them i would never i hadn't purchased a a launch day EA product since about 2012 when I think Madden came out with that new sort of physics system. And then I would just buy them used at, at GameStop, absolutely the cheapest level possible. I, I don't require the latest teams or uniforms just to have a, a, a game night and a couple beers with, uh, with a friend of mine. So EA Access is actually... Probably, I've renewed it now for the second year, so they got $60 out of me that they probably wouldn't have got. I mean, if I'm buying these games used at GameStop, they're not getting anything. And I haven't purchased a, a new EA game since uh, Titanfall, which was 2014, I think. I, and I, the only reason I bought that was because at that point... Had I built it? No, I hadn't. No, that was 2014. I don't know why I bought that, actually. Oh, I know. I, had, I I didn't build a new computer. I got a new graphics card, and I just wanted to to try it out. So that was kind of a an anomaly. But yeah, so I, I hadn't really spent 60 bucks with EA outside of that in four years. Uh, so... EA Access has been worth the money. Now, I, I don't like every game. I, I do wind up deleting it. But that's the kind of model where, you know, if I paid 60 bucks for Madden 2015 or whatever, 2016, whatever the, the one that came out last year was, I would have been pretty disappointed. It's the same game over and over and over again. But for 30 bucks a year, 
it, it's, I think, a pretty good value. So I don't know what other developers would, would have to sort of price their yearly catalog at, but obviously Netflix costs you 120 bucks a year, so you want to think maybe 50 to 60% of that, depending on the publisher. Now, obviously, obviously, if it's a small kind of niche publisher, they're not going to do this, but take Capcom for an example. I have not purchased a Capcom game since... Uh, I think brand new, day one, since the Marvel, the ori the original re-release or like recreation of the Marvel vs. Capcom game. That was about 2010. I did purchase on Steam after 2010 well, the Dead Rising, one of the Dead Rising games, but that was on sale for like six dollars or something like that so they haven't gotten a, a ton of money from me and then of course i've purchased street fighter 5 which i uh, i dearly dearly regret doing but i don't know what capcom releases in a year if they've got two three games a year maybe they charge you 30 bucks like ea access maybe they charge you 40 bucks because they're trying to get into the whole street fighter thing but you figure with Street Fighter V, you know, as an eSport, you're going to be paying that for uh, certainly more more than a year. Activision, uh, you get your Call of Duty, you get your Skylanders. I think that's the way. And of course, how many of these are you going to subscribe to? I don't think Nintendo would do it, but actually I think Nintendo would command the highest price. Now, what this is going to do is going to force games to be digital only. These subscriptions will be digital I guess for the people who want physical media or don't have a good internet connection, uh, they could still be sold on a, at a per game basis. But I don't mind going digital when I can pay a set fee and have access to a catalog for a year. That to me would be worth it, as as opposed to paying sixty bucks and being in this generation. Let's face it, ultimately disappointed with a lot of these games, and then nickel and dime to death. Now, you're going to say, well, what would prevent them from having DLC and microtransactions in these subscription fees? My argument would be they don't have to price it at a point where you don't have to do that or you tier your subscription so that you just get, like, the base game or the base game plus the DLC. But, again, it would be cheaper than buying everything in a developer's catalog. Now, I'm going to admit, I don't know what the deal is with DLC and EA Access. I don't care about the trading card things that they do in Madden and all of that stuff. So, I don't know if you can still buy it, even though the game's a year old. They they don't necessarily make you wait a full year to buy these games, but I think like around the Super Bowl, that's when that year's Madden was released for access, which uh, which was fine for me. I think this would give players a certain degree of protection against absolute debacles. I mean, take Batman, the Arkham Knight game, or whatever the, the one was from, uh, not this past summer, but the previous summer that was a complete disaster. You know, if, if you were getting for a 50 or 60 buck yearly subscription fee a number of games, you could kind of say, oh, well... I'll let them deal with their issues, and then hopefully things will recover. You could, incidentally, if you're a Capcom or a Konami or a Nintendo, and if you went with a subscription fee, not only could you release your, your current yearly catalog, but you could also include access to the back catalog as, as kind of a value add for the, the customers, even if you charged a couple extra bucks for that. So there's a way, I think, to... I think take a lot of the financial pressure off of these companies. It's a way to ameliorate the concerns of the consumer who's afraid of, at least I am, of buying a substandard product. And I've gotten, like I said in a couple episodes ago, I've gotten to the point where uh, I just I just don't care anymore. I'm not I'm not buying new releases. And and the Forza thing, as much as I want to buy that, um, and, and I think I will probably make an exception in that case because. The Forza games have just been so good and have really delivered. But other things that I was excited for, I'm just not giving a damn about, quite frankly. Uh, so I, I, I think this could 
potentially stop that kind of thinking. If you said, and actually I think Microsoft and Sony could do this with all their first party stuff and maybe get, make that a tier of Xbox Live or PlayStation Network. So that you know that at least if you had those subscriptions, you're getting a nice, consistent three or four exclusive games per year, plus probably some access to a couple indie games on on the store uh, with the indie developers with whom they've got a special relationship. And I think if they don't move to that model at some point, this industry is going to, I hate to say be in danger, but I think you're going to lose a lot of the older crowd. I, I, I know that kids don't have a problem paying DLC and stuff like that, but I'm getting to the point where I'm just... I, I, I guess I could if I wanted to, but I think you get to the point when, you, when you're a little bit older where you say, you know, money is a finite resource, obviously, and there's so many other things that you can do with it that are interesting and entertaining... So I'm not, you know, if you're gonna, if I'm gonna have to pay sixty bucks for this game, and then you're gonna dick me around for all these other things, and I'm not gonna get the full experience, and of course now you're gonna, if it's, you're gonna tell me when I can play it, for how long I can play it, I, I would just rather not. I don't need to be bothered. I mean, it's it's financial, but it's also a hassle after a while, where you just, uh, and and maybe it's uh, an aging gamer problem, but. I kind of was looking at my shelf, and I, I was looking at the Super Nintendo section, and I said, you know, I... First of all, some of those games were more than $60, and I never felt, you know, gypped. I never felt like, even if the game wasn't great, and I'm going to call out a game here for which I may take some slack, but take um, Super Punch-Out. Now, Super Punch-Out, I mean, Punch-Out's a very good game, but let's face it, it's a... It's a pattern-based game. It's it's not something you're going to sink 20 or 30 hours into. It's a, it's a fun diversion. But whatever I paid for that when it was new, and it, it was it was fine. I mean, you get the, the box art, you get the great instruction manual, the whole package. It, it felt worth it in, in a physical form. When you purchase a new game today and there's no instruction manual and it's the cheapest box and the cheapest cover, and... In fact, a lot of the times, the cheapest kind of content, the most derivative kind of content, I have reached a point where I, I just I don't need to buy that. Give that to me as a subscription, um, because what they're doing now is they're they're not even I I really think that they're moving in, into this model where they're not the the game that they're creating is kind of a of a secondary consideration in the long run. What they're trying to do is monetize your time. They're trying to figure out how to get you committed to an investment of X amount of hours of your life to this digital interactive amusement. And then they're going to figure out, and they're figuring out increasing ways to uh, extract money from that time investment. They're going to slice it up in all different ways, and they're going to lock content behind paywalls. And they're going to tell you, you know, when and how and for how long you can play this stuff. And that's just going to drive away customers. I think you, you would have a much better chance at retaining some of the 30 to 50-year-old gamers that are around there now, plus expand the market if you had a subscription model where you can say, hey, hey, try it for two weeks, see if you like it, try it for a year, and I think if, if that sort of worked out, I know I personally... With uh, EA Access, I, I would gladly try a different one for 30 bucks a year. I might try two or three if I thought the, the catalog was intriguing enough. So, I doubt this is going to happen. I think this is... Uh, I don't want to say it's a pie-in-the-sky idea. I think it's a, a rational idea. But I, I think developers are afraid to try something like that. And I think customers... If, if the developers and publishers did price this content at such a level where they didn't need to do the DLC and the monetization stuff, I think consumers would probably be taken aback. I mean, maybe I mean, EA Access is, is fairly cheap, but they're also getting a big chunk of change from the initial buyer who needs to pay uh, play Madden and, and will pay for it on day one. 
I don't know what a, what a company like Rockstar, you know, where they're coming out with essentially one game every so many years. Although I can kind of almost excuse that because those games, you know, obviously Grand Theft Auto V was a tremendous achievement. But what does Bethesda do where over the course of two or three years they may have two or three games? How do you price that? And if they said it's going to cost you 90 bucks for the next Oblivion uh, as part of our subscription and then you'll get access to whatever else we're working on or we've worked on. You can play Elder Scrolls online. Uh, I think customers would balk at that. I personally got more than 60 bucks worth of time out of the uh, Skyrim. So paying for uh, 90 bucks for the next version of that, I would personally have no problem with. But I think, yeah, I think there's a, a, there'd be kind of pushback there on consumers. But what's, I, I mean... To these people, I would say, no, look, you're you're buying this stuff, you're coughing up this money. Okay, you pay sixty bucks now and thirty bucks later. Just get it all up front and sink some time into it, and actually have a product, not a not an experience, not a a, a kind of timed amusement. No, no, get a product, get the full product, and enjoy it on your terms. And if that's going to cost more than sixty dollars. I'm okay with that. And I know you might say, well, okay, but you're older and you have disposable income and, and whatever. But I would think even as a, even when I wasn't older and I didn't have disposable income, when I got those games that were super expensive, the, the RPGs on the, the Super Nintendo eventually, and some of the the other games that were, uh, I mean, some of the Super, uh, not Super Nintendo, the N64 games were pretty pricey. I ultimately felt, okay, I got my money's worth out of that. I seem to remember that the wrestling games were fairly pricey, the Aki Corp wrestling games, but I played played those a ton. So uh, hopefully it's a direction that more developers would, will take, but I think we need to, to get away ultimately from this predatory model that is affecting the industry. <laughs> All right, a little follow-up to uh, last episode's piece on advertising. Very, very funny thing happened. So I posted that, and I was immediately hit with a copyright claim. Apparently, uh, the clip of the George Carlin little poem about advertising was copyrighted by some someone. And, of course, uh, they didn't want me to take it down. They just wanted to monetize uh, the video. And so, first of all, let me say that if you want to go back and watch it again, or at least fire up the video again with Adblock, please do so. So this greedy scumbag corporation uh, doesn't get any money off of that. But I think this highlights the, the very point I was making, this advertising psychosis. So let's look at that episode. Uh, the episode clocked in at about, so oh, I don't know, three hours and 18 minutes. Now, in that three hours and 18 minutes, I did use uh, material owned by others. You know, I, I splice in those game music clips, but I don't monetize these videos. I don't make any money off of this podcast. I do it because I think it, it breaks up the segments nicely. It adds to kind of the retro feel. And in the case of this George Carlin clip, it fit perfectly with the theme of the episode and the issues I was discussing. So, to me, that's fair use. I suspect if you added up all of the audio that I don't own 
in that episode, you would get about four minutes, maybe, four or five minutes, in a three-hour podcast. Now, the Carlin clip itself was, I think, a minute and a half. So because I used a minute and a half of this audio, uh, I lose all all of the, the profits to be had from this video. What I see here is a company taking uh, my three, well, okay, so I'm saying it's, it's four minutes. So taking my three hours and 14 minutes of original audio, and because I used a minute and a half of their stuff, or at least stuff that they own the rights to, uh, I lose out on the ability to make money from that show. Or they are profiting off of my work. Now, yes, I was using a clip that I didn't own. So you would think that maybe they could take 10%, 20% of the proceeds and I could take the rest since I did most of the work in that video. And that, that is precisely, and of course, we're talking about advertising psychosis. I mean, how many views do I get on these YouTube uploads of the podcast? I mean, if I'm lucky, maybe 100, usually in the neighborhood of 60 or 70. So, and again, I don't monetize them. So how much money is this company really going to make? Uh, right now, the video has 53 views. Maybe after two weeks, it's going to get up to 80. I mean, are they going to make a cent, one or two cents off of this? Again, it's rent-seeking. It's, it's, what, it's what you call economic rent-seeking. They bought the clipped... They own the clip to Carl and stuff, and they'll take every cent that they can get. Um, so, fairly amusing there. Uh, the other point I, I, I wanted to make is uh, the point about exploitation that I didn't think I brought out enough in those segments. Um, you know, I, I've always said that we the users and the content creators make the platform successful. So when YouTube goes and turns their back on the creators and says, hey, we're going to come up with all sorts of different new applications of this guideline, and if we don't think you're advertiser-friendly, you use the ability to earn money off of your work. Um, that's a problem for all the reasons that I said, but it's also a form of exploitation. In that, I think, there's a certain desperation that goes into content creation. And I'm speaking uh, from myself, but I also, from discussing things with others uh, online, or from following people, you get to a point, particularly I think in the retro gaming media, where you desperately want to talk about these games. You want an outlet. And as many of us know, it's very difficult to find people in our everyday lives that are passionate about retro gaming. So the natural thing for us to do in that kind of state of desperation, and look, it's not the desperation of, of hunger or financial need, but you just, there's a lot of stuff that you want to get off your chest. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you want to talk about. So you come on and you create a video um, and hopefully you engage in that discussion online or you go to a forum or, or something like that. But obviously in YouTube, you know, you're going to make a video and YouTube depends on that. They depend on certain people just being driven to create. Uh, I mean, it's an artistic impulse as well. I think those of us who uh, have produced works of art, whether they're films, literature, uh, poetry, painting, whatever, you create, I think, real artists create because they're just driven to do it. They can't do otherwise. And YouTube and other social media platforms desperately need that. They, they, they are uh, banking on the creative impulse of people, providing them with content that they essentially get for free and for which they pay out the slightest little cut of what they get. 
So last month I felt compelled to put together three hours of audio. I thought there were a number of topics worth discussing. And of course I get nothing and I, and I actually lose the ability to get the slightest little bit of revenue from that. Not that I particularly wanted it because again, I don't monetize these things, but obviously someone thought it was worth uh, monetizing. Now, I think the broader point, too, is that as life, at least here in the United States, gets a little bit, ah, how can we put this diplomatically, um, as we find our working life, uh, for many of us anyway, unless you own a small business or you're part of the 1%, but as, as you find, as many of us find our working life more constricted, uh, our ability to contribute meaningfully to organizations kind of whittled away um, as we kind of lack a, a basic and, and I think for a lot of people respect for their work as you kind of become the proverbial cog in the machine. I think it's a natural human impulse to seek some place where you can have a voice. And I think the internet particularly between 2010 and now, uh, has given people a, a, an easy, sophisticated, and more or less free way of disseminating their voice. And uh, I think that it's not a coincidence that YouTube and other sites are taking advantage of that. We've, as I've mentioned in the last episode, and, and because so many of us are in that position, the overall value of the content is driven down. So the more you speak, the less you're worth. And we're seeing that here. YouTube doesn't really care if 10 or 15 people get really pissed off at this, unless you're the top 10 or 15 people who are pissed off at these new regulations. So I always try to say, well, you know, is there a solution? Is there something to do about it? I don't know if there's anything to do about it. Um, I guess you can just stop talking, stop contributing to the platform. But I don't think that's fair to people who produce videos. I think it does fill a need or for people who uh, disseminate their art on various platforms. But I think eventually we have to get to the point where we can have an intelligent discussion about, well, what is this stuff really worth? And, you know, I, I look at my podcast and I, and I say, well, uh, yeah, I do this as a hobby. I, I do it for free. And I think if you look at, I, I obviously put out the 10th episode, uh, that was the last episode, and I, I have about 28 hours of audio over 10 episodes. I think that's pretty good. I think if people uh, listen to the podcasts and discover the various segments, they'll find me uh, talking about issues that don't usually get a lot of press uh, in gaming media. And I honestly think that's worth something. Should I make a living off of it? No. Am I going to compromise the show in any way to make money off of it? No. But in the broader scheme of things there should be some value attached to that. Similarly, I've always said, you know, with regard to the YouTube videos, the few videos that uh, I have out there that, that have done well and that have had advertising attached to it, the pittance that you get is uh, a problem. I, I think there's an argument to be made that those of us uh, who do create things uh, should have a fair shot at, at compensation. I mean, you see this all the time, you know, with, uh, supposedly, uh, it's a particular problem with musicians and actors who are basically told, Hey, you got to work for free just to get your name out there. And I'm not totally familiar with those debates, but there is a kind of a move in those fields to really say, Hey, no, we're not going to work for free. Uh, we're, we're not going to do a show for free just because you pull in an audience that there is some, value to artistic labor. Now, you may say, well, if I believe that, why am I against advertising? And 
I would point out, I'm not against advertising. I'm against intrusive, psychotic advertising that steals your life. So if you want to have a banner on the page, or if you want to say simply, hey, support this artist by clicking here, and it takes you to the website of, of someone, and if you complete a sale, you either get a higher percentage of that click-through, that's perfectly fine. But I would say, look at YouTube, one of the most, uh, one of the, you know, the largest, not one of, the largest video platform online owned by a multi-billion dollar company who makes a business off of ad revenue. I would say to the company, hey, how about you kick something back to the creators? How about you at least allow them to have a shot at making a higher percentage uh off of their work and for someone like me it's not going to matter one way or another but it could matter to those who really have this as a career and who are trying to uh, put out content on a, on a regular basis and I also think it would actually spur on creativity because if people realize they had a, a shot at getting discovered and a shot at getting compensated for what they're doing maybe they wouldn't feel compelled to put out the kind of derivative video content that we're seeing, and that's turning YouTube into nothing more than a, a goofy cable channel. I, I think you want, I think it's in everyone's interest to come up with a compensation scheme and a content discovery mechanism that puts a lot of different types of videos out there and, and gives uh, a number of people a shot to build an audience. But I think just relying on the desperate human need for self-expression in an age when the opportunities for meaningful self-expression in society are being constantly restricted uh, is probably a practice that can continue forever. And uh, YouTube will probably have uh, no qualms about just doing the advertisers bidding in even worse ways. But hopefully uh, the content creators can get together and try to find some, uh, come up with a platform, come up with a movement of some kind to combat this because otherwise we'll just be singing and dancing for fewer and fewer pennies. So a couple days ago, I was just searching around on the internet, and I kept on seeing, kind of in my news feed, something called YouTube Heroes. And I ignored it for a little bit, because I figured it was some sort of nonsensical reality show with PewDiePie or something that they were pushing on YouTube Red. Uh, as it turns out, it is another utterly nefarious turn by YouTube, which pretty much makes so much of the stuff I've said about the platform... Uh, right, and I'm talking over the past three years, I've, I've been criticizing certain aspects of YouTube, and I wish I, I had been wrong about it, but I would have to say I was pretty dead on as to what uh, they are becoming, and it's to everyone's detriment. So this program, you know, on top of all of the nonsense that I talked about in the last podcast, and I even followed up here on, on this podcast with... Uh, the ad insanity and, and the fact that they were trying to control inappropriate content, whatever that meant. Well, now this YouTube Heroes, rather than being a YouTube Red reality program, is a program which encourages YouTube users to sign up as moderators, essentially, and to go out and flag inappropriate videos as a YouTube trusted flagger. 
now. Uh, apparently you will get, and, and to be fair, there are some other things you can do. You can add captions and subtitles to videos to help the hearing impaired and share your knowledge with other users on the YouTube help forum. So those last two points are bullshit. Obviously, what this is about is getting a group of people together to do the work that YouTube is either too lazy, too cheap, or too insecure to do itself. So one of the things that you can get, and of course as you click through this stuff, you'll see in their cute videos, you know, they'll have like little deputy badges but obviously, removing copyrighted material uh, of any kind, things that are pornographic, violent. I mean, you, you know, obviously you want to get pornography and uh, depictions of extreme violence off of YouTube. I understand that. But to, to really go after uh, violations of, of copyright and, again, other inappropriate speech, and we don't know what that is. It seems like these people could flag anything that they deem personally offensive. And again, that would be keeping with YouTube's policy when we go back to the demonetization of unpopular videos. Who, who is to say what is popular or unpopular? Who is to say what is offensive? Uh, obviously, this lends itself to the kind of abuse of someone with a particular agenda going around and flagging various videos, and of course it leads to people fucking with content creators. I mean, basically, that you give people this power, and you know that there's going to be a certain element of the community that abuses it, whether it is for, for a political platform, or just, hey, uh, I'm tired of listening to YouTuber X, you know, let me fuck around with him. Uh, this is a, an utter disgrace, and the fact that you know, they talk about some perks, and you can, you know, you know, you'll you'll level up. Uh, you know, they've basically gamified peer surveillance, basically. So you'll level up, and you can go to a conference, and you can sort of, I, I guess, eventually go to, a, you know, reach someone on YouTube if a live person, if you wanted to talk to someone. All all of this uh, insanity. So. You know, it's funny, uh, a YouTube hero, it's it's amusing that they're calling it a hero. At uh, previous points in history, this was called being an informant, informing on your fellow citizens. Now, of course, again, people who are talking about this are saying, well, YouTube is a private company, blah, 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 you know what my feelings are about that. If you watch, and I do recommend that you watch it, it's a, it's a great movie. There's a movie called The Lives of Others that talks about the East German secret police state. And what they used to do is something actually shockingly similar to this. They didn't call their informants uh, heroes. Uh, they called their informants unofficial or uh, unofficial collaborators or employees. Uh, it's a German film. It actually just means uh, informal employee. And they go around and they say, you know, I know you're a drug dealer or I know you're a pervert or something like that, and we can arrest you for that. That's, you know, that stuff is illegal, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that terrible. Tell you what is terrible, your husband, who is producing anti-government literature in his basement. Now, we could arrest you and put you in jail for 10 years, but you know what, if you just tell us about your husband and what he's doing and who he's circulating these papers to. You know what? If you're a drug addict, we'll give you some drugs. If you're a pervert, we'll throw some porn your way. Just let us know what your your husband or your brother, or your sister, or your neighbor is doing. That is, I think, at the heart of what's going on here. I mean, it also has some other advantages for YouTube. Of course, uh, if they wanted to really moderate the site and, and get the banned stuff off, but prevent restrictions on unpopular speech and restrictions on free speech and keep the ethos of democratic participation going on YouTube, well, of course, they could hire people to do this. But of course, if you hire someone to do this, you'd have to pay them a living wage and give them health care. And it's so much easier to have, I don't know, 13-year-old kids do your work for you. So it avoids that pitfall. And then, 
If you did this yourself, you would actually have to be really careful about what you pulled down. It would seem like you as YouTube, the powers from Mountain View, California, or wherever YouTube is headquartered these days, it would seem like you, know, you might come off as evil, right? And of course, Google, uh, their motto at one point used to be, uh, do no evil. Uh, I don't know what the new Alphabet Company's motto is, but uh, presumably that evil thing has uh, has gone uh, gone away as the company has developed. So, if you just say, "Oh well, it's not us who said that this video was inappropriate; it's just a group of users. What can we do? This is the community policing itself." Uh, it is utter nonsense, and I think this is yet another step in the downfall of YouTube eventually making it into a kind of bland, benign, shallow type of internet video content that you can push out to all sorts of devices and ultimately charge for. I mean, any number of opinions are fundamentally unpopular, and I, I personally like the fact that there are some people who go out on YouTube and speak their minds, and, and even if I disagree with them, I, I still think watching their stuff is interesting. I, I don't happen to believe that uh, the the devil and aliens are collaborating to screw Donald Trump out of the election, but when Alex Jones, uh, on his conspiracy theory show, takes his shirt off and starts screaming into the camera, I'll admit, occasionally I've watched those videos. I, I think they have a, a right to exist. So, on a kind of personal, uh, selfish note, I, I'd be curious to know if any of my content gets flagged, because I've actually have some fairly, in you know, I don't want to say inappropriate, but unpopular opinions, and if people with certain agendas were to, to listen to the podcast, I'm sure a couple of episodes would be flagged, as well as a couple of uh, videos that I have out there, it would just be kind of a gauge of, well, it was a gauge of two things, really, of my popularity, which... Let's face it, it's not, uh, not quite nil, but around that. But it will also be an interesting bar barometer of this program. If people get really crazy about this, how far are they going to dig in YouTube to crush dissenting voices? Uh, very, very dangerous times that we are entering with regard to social media, YouTube in particular. And I can only reiterate the call that I made in the last episode, and that is someone needs to come up with real competition. Someone needs... And it's got to be the content creators. It's got to be the, the people who have done well in this system that have some capital to, to kind of throw at creating a new, a new video platform that says, hey, this is where the dissenting voices will go. This will be the popular alternative for, for real, unfiltered, uncensored content on YouTube. And again, I hate the word content. I'll use it, uh, not, but not on YouTube. I mean, on the internet. You know, YouTube can be its curated batch of preteen bullshit, and then you'll have this other site that will cater to an intelligent, mature audience that can handle opinions that diverge from their own. You've heard me kind of go after Forza's business practices and their staggered release schedule and things like that, but how is the actual game? Well, I picked it up uh, right on the release day, or the release day for those who didn't want to pay $100, and I've put about four hours into it, and I'm kind of surprised. I'm, I'm, I feel a little let down by it, and you may say, well, that's nothing new. You're let down by all modern games, and... I guess to an extent that's been true over the past couple of months, six, eight months. But if you've been listening to the show, you know I was pumped for this game. I was completely hyped, and I was 
sure I was going to like this. No matter what they did, even if it was a complete rehash of the other game, I was going to like this game. But my disappointment is more technical in nature than it is than it has to do with the actual game. And one of the reasons why I wanted to pick this up was because it was the first or one of the first play or X, Xbox One Play Anywhere games where you can sort of buy it either on the Windows Store or on the Xbox One Store and load it on both machines. So I picked it up on the PC because, of course, I've got the, the juiced up PC. I wanted to see exactly what this game was going to offer. I figured Forza on the PC is a dream, and if you've played Forza Apex, their free-to-play game on the PC, I think that has held up. I mean, it's the same incredible Forza 6 engine, basically, at least I think it is. Uh, plays just like Forza 6, 60 FPS, but can go all the way up to 4K and looks absolutely brilliant. So I just assumed that Horizon would be more of the same. And I have to say, I, I, I will mention that this Play Anywhere thing wasn't exactly seamless for me. For whatever reason, and I, I don't know even why, how this came about, but I, I guess I have a different Xbox One account than I do a PC account. Now, I assumed everything I purchased on the Windows PC store was linked to my Xbox One account because I could see it in the Xbox app or whatever you want to call it on the PC, and it has my Xbox One name, so I just assumed it knew that I was buying it through that account, but apparently that is not the case, so I had to figure out why that was, and, and basically all I had to do was log in with this PC account on the Xbox One and it all linked up, but that wasn't immediately apparent, and I couldn't quite find an answer to that, but that was my fault, that has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the game. The problem with the game is it is an immense resource hog. And I've been looking at some of the, the benchmarks. I mean, to get this thing to run at 4K, 60 FPS, I mean, you need the most expensive rig out there, basically, with, you know, the Pascal, uh, whatever the highest-end Pascal card is. It's no longer the 1080. They've, they've got, a you know, the big Pascal card. I, I forget what it's called. And even that struggled at 4K. But the shocking thing is you looked at the benchmarks, was that it struggled equally, or if not more so, at 1080p. So it's very hard to get this game running at a solid FPS, and I can confirm that. I hadn't read really any of the PC reports prior to getting it. I was playing it, and I just I was seeing all of the stuttering. I was like, wow, this this thing must really be a beast. So I'm like, all right, I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to lower the settings. I'm going to try it at 1080 and actually it got worse for me. I found that for me, running it at 144 FPS on Ultra with uh, 1440p, while it does sort of stutter and slow down a bit, it actually wasn't as bad as, as lowering the settings. So I think this is uh, an optimization issue. I mean, with an i7 uh, 1080, GTX 1080, uh, I 16 gigabytes of RAM. I should be able to run this thing comfortably at ultra, I think, because I'm not running it at 4K. And it just doesn't run that well. I, I notice uh, a good bit of stuttering when you start up the game, almost as if it's loading in a lot of the landscapes and textures. And, and then as you play, that settles down a bit, but it's not completely absent. And it stutters in a way that makes the game feel broken that actually disrupts the driving experience, particularly if you're doing the the drifting and, and, and some things that require precise cornering. So it's very off-putting, and, and I think one of the great things about Forza was, or at least the Forza Horizon series, was this sense of freedom, the sense of, you know, you can go off the road and go anywhere and explore things, and it was just kind of a, a seamless world. You know, you're going through a field of flowers and you're kicking up dirt. And it was just kind of beautiful to watch that animation play out. And I find that on, on the PC, it just gets very clunky in those situations. To, to say nothing of races or even just kind of loading the car. You know, it goes into the, the quick cut, door opening, heavy bass sort of sound stage. And you get to see all the, the various uh, angles of the car before you get in it. And even even that 
slows down. Even that chugs. I mean, even the, the main menu is chugging along. So uh, I just think it's poorly uh, optimized. And that's a shame because it the series has, set, has sent such a high expectation, particularly with the, the main series on the Xbox One always being 60 FPS, Apex 60 FPS. And it's just a beautiful game at that speed. And, and I know Forza 2 was not... But you figure for the PC, they're going to nail this. And then the ability to play it at uh, 144, I was just salivating at uh, the opportunity to do that. But it's just not a great experience on the PC. So I figured, all right, well, let me play it on the Xbox. And to a degree, the Xbox version, I think, is the, the actually the better version. Because even though it's capped at 30, and it drops a little bit here or there, it's not as abrupt as the PC, it's not as noticeable, and visually it looks okay. I've got the old school Xbox. I'm not upgrading to whatever the new thing is, the One S. Maybe I'll get the Project Scorpio, but I'm not sure. I don't have an HDR TV. I'm perfectly happy with the OLED here, so uh, I, I can't evaluate the HDR effects. But it's it's a very nice, well designed world and. It's not bad playing it on the Xbox. The only problem is having now been doing the majority of my racing on the PC, it's very hard to go back to racing at 30 FPS. So, so there's this, for the person who straddles the, the PC and the Xbox One, and, and I, I'm not saying this to be sort of uh, arrogant or something, but I, I think the... the, the customer with some disposable income who's got the huge rig, who's got the the Xbox, is primarily going to be upset by what I'm talking about here. But I think it's precisely that demographic that Microsoft is targeting. The one that exists, the people who are primarily PC gamers but happen to have a console, or those who are console gamers who have just gotten into PC... And particularly that latter market is what they should be willing to, or they should be trying to expand. So, hey, if you're willing to give us uh, your 60 bucks, and you can only do it, of course, on the Xbox One store or the Windows 10 store, you know, hey, give us your, your 60 bucks. You can play it on both platforms. Maybe it expands the PC platform. Maybe it gets people uh, upgrading their graphics cards. So there's a huge upside to this kind of business approach. To say nothing of the fact that it's going to, I think, potentially bring a lot of players over to the Microsoft side. And to have this big a title release in this technical state is a huge disappointment because playing on the PC, you don't feel like you're getting the best experience. You don't feel like you were the, you know, premium customer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, actually, you feel rather gypped. And so your, your choice is trying to get an inconsistent 60 FPS or an inconsistent... 144 FPS or dropping down to the console and playing at a at an FPS and, and at a lower resolution, but but at 30 frames per second, it is a substandard way to at this point play video games at, at 30 S, uh, FPS. So, and again, I, I'm not saying that to sound elitist. I, I just think that 60 is the number that they should target. And uh, one of the reasons why I do more of my modern gaming on the PC is because it achieves that frame rate and it's just better to play. And I think if you look at the consoles and at the games that, that do hit that target, they are, I think, generally more enjoyable mechanically. So, it's a problem. Now, as far as the content goes, I have to say I'm a little disappointed there. I mean, like I said, it's a beautiful world. What... Forza has accomplished with the Horizon series is, I think, very impressive. And, it, like I said, it's the best third-person, fun, arcade racing game I think ever made. Um, and, and I always liked Midnight Club. But it's it's that, that style of game that takes me back to the early 2000s where it, it felt like with a lot of these driving games, you're, you're finally experiencing a broader world than just circuit driving, which was, with a few exceptions, the only thing that, that you could do on, on the consoles prior to that era. So to see that idea of free-roaming 
automobile exploration taken to this level is incredibly satisfying. And I fell in love with Forza 2. I picked it up just because I had gotten an Xbox One a little bit later and there was a lot of hype around it and I played the heck out of it and uh, completed it. I'm not sure if I 100%ed it. Um, I want to say that I did, but I could have missed a couple different things here or there. Uh, but it was a, a gorgeous, gorgeous game. I played it with my girlfriend. And she uh, she got into it, which was uh, which was a surprise. So this um, you know this game, while consciously trying to top it, I I think, and I think it does. Like I said, in in the aesthetic, and you know Australia. I know a lot of people like the setting. To me, Australia doesn't do much for me. Of course, it gives you the different types of terrains, but I actually preferred Italy and France. There's something about racing Ferraris and Lamborghinis in their country of origin and then crossing over into Nice or wherever that was, uh, the Côte d'Azur. I mean, it was just, it was wonderful. It just captured so much. It was just an amazing feeling. This is a little bit less so. I, I know you get the the sort of, I don't know what you call those things, the Holden pickup trucks and stuff like that, which is kind of unique. A lot of dune buggies and four-wheel drive vehicles and pickups. So I, you know, it's not my favorite, but I wouldn't complain about that. I, I think it, it's encountering a repetition problem. I, I, and maybe it's just because I played Forza Horizon 2 late. I, I'm not sure when it came out. I mean, maybe it came out in the fall of 2014 and I picked it up in the winter of 2015 so it's not that long ago and I've played it I've gone back to it many times since so maybe I'm not the right candidate to get back into Forza and be amazed as I was the first time but to me it feels just very repetitive just a lot of the same racing events just cast in different ways okay you're gonna do the horizon race but oh there's this illegal syndicate out there so you're going to race them but it's the exact same sort of thing except instead of the horizon flyers you have blue flares and stuff like that uh, it's still fun to go after the barn finds of course now the conceit is that you're uh the run the person who runs the festival the ceo of horizon but your daily calendar and your progression of the game is exactly the same as when you were the upstart driver in version 2, with the slight exception that you can kind of put together events and you can create like a championship where you're going to different locations. But again, once you do that, once you go through that series of clicks, you're having the same race. And I think in a way the expansiveness of the map... Uh, like I said, there are beautiful sections of it. It feels like just driving around, driving from point A to point B is actually a little grating this time. It's not, I don't know, it's just not as fun to explore as the second one. And again, it could just be the fact that uh, I've, I'm at a point where I've, I've played enough of this game and, and it's not surprising me anymore. I think one of the problems it has is there's no fast travel and I think they need to give you that option. I think you can unlock it. It's it's a perk that you can unlock, but it should be available from the start because why should I have to drive halfway across this in-game continent to get to the next race when I should be able to do it on the spot? Same with switching out cars. You should be able to just switch out cars immediately. I think that would actually, and again, I, I, I do believe that is a perk, but it should be unlocked from the start. Okay, I've driven my Lamborghini out into the sticks. I've had my race. And you know what? I'd like to go exploring in my pickup or in my ATV or something. But in order to make that switch out, okay, I've got to drive all the way back to the city, switch out the cars, drive all the way back to wherever I was, to just explore that area. Um, now, again, they will. They do charge you. They, I guess they have this option where they'll drop another car of yours in a location near where you are for these credits, but why waste credits? Uh, I'd rather use those credits to buy cars. So, um, it's... Like I said, it's, it's not a bad game. I think if you're a fan of the series, it's by and large enjoyable, and I think if you stick to the Xbox One, you've played it on the Xbox One, and, and that's the version you know, then you're not going to have this issue of, how oh, do I play it at a, at a crippled 60 or a consistent... 
30. You'll just play it at consistent 30 and enjoy it. But I'm just disappointed. Like I said, the, the bar is set so high, I think, for Forza. I think that they have completely captured the console driving audience at this point. Uh, I think they've stolen the crown from GTA, and I didn't like the Forts games. I was always a GTA guy on the PS2, PS3, and I only started getting into Forza because there was just nothing going on in the GT, uh, GTA, in the GT camp, Gran Turismo camp. So it's just sad to see um, this not fully live up to those expectations that I had. Now, granted, they could patch it, they could optimize it, NVIDIA could release a driver and uh, correct it. And, and I think to be fair, uh, I, I should have mentioned this as I was talking about performance, the 1080 performance, I guess, in the spectrum of all of the issues that people are having is not bad. So I'm complaining about occasional drops and hitches and uh, a, a kind of, uh, you know, hiccupy sort of game world. But I know, I think for AMD, it's even worse. I know people, you know, just crashing. It's not, it's just won't even load or they're getting horrendous dips into the, into the 20s. So I think you need to bear that in mind. I, I'm complaining, but I'm not experiencing the brunt of these issues. But I do hope that it is corrected because I think it's actually a game I would prefer to play on the PC. Um, and, and it's nice playing it on the big TV and, and the sound system and everything. But I think it actually works as a quick game. You can fire up, drive around the world a little bit, play a few races, unlock a few things, and get back to whatever else you were doing. So I'd say just, you know, it's a word, a word of caution. I don't, I, I can't say I, I don't recommend it. I, I think it's uh, ambitious and well done and, and has a great car lineup and stuff like that. I would say... Uh, if you're a PC gamer, wait a little bit, and if you are not a super fan of this series, uh, you might wait until it drops a little bit in price, because it's not offering anything tremendously different from what came before it. Welcome to the hardware update. It's Home Theater Update version 2. Now, last month I talked about the new, uh, or at least new to me, SVS uh, PB1000 subwoofer and some general home theater tips as they related to gaming. And in that piece I said, I think my last upgrade is going to be a, a, a new receiver. And I talked about buying the wrong receiver. Just sort of buying on brand. I bought a Pioneer brand and it was really too weak for my room. And I said, I'm just going to wait and then I'll get it eventually. And that's going to be it. Well, uh, I didn't wait. I kind of had the home theater bug. And if this is a, a secondary hobby of yours, you'll know that when that home theater bug bites you, you kind of dive right in. And it's actually, a, it's become a nice secondary hobby, even though I'm fairly, like I said, I'm really limited with the room that I, I have for it. But it's been actually fairly interesting. I've run sort of the, the gamut uh, since the last episode. So what did I do? I said, you know, okay, I'm going to look seriously at some new receivers, and I'm going to buy a receiver. And I didn't know I was going to buy it right away, but I, I'm going to find a receiver that I that's going to have more power for this room and is going to be something that's going to let me grow in the future if I move, if I have a different setup, something like that. So what I first did was I I picked up, I, I sort of went up the price scale. I was like, okay, well, I paid pretty cheap price for the one that I have now. It was like on closing, maybe for 350 bucks. So I'm thinking, I'm going to see what's in the in the 500 range. Uh, well, it doesn't have what I want. Okay, 600. Well, what I wound up doing is I purchased 
the the mid-range Yamaha Avantage receiver. Now, Avantage is a line of audiophile, quote-unquote, Yamaha receivers, and it, it, it's recommended by a number of people. It gets some good uh, write-ups in the press and, and stuff like that. I, I, the Audioholics guys, if you follow them, they, they love the stuff, but they probably, I think, have a relationship with Yamaha. So anyway, I get this thing and this is this what cost me almost $980 for this thing. And I I get it home and I'm you know the sound isn't great. I I have to admit and I I figured, well, it's my room acoustics. I'm really going to try this out. So I really went through this and kind of just used all the settings and Ultimately, I found that the, the center channel was kind of weak. It didn't seem to have the power as a 100-watt receiver. I was coming from an 80-watt receiver, and a 100-watt receiver should be pretty powerful, but it, it had kind of a a flat, uninspired sound. It wasn't bad. Uh, it was a little bit more dynamic than the Pioneer, but it wasn't discernibly better than the Pioneer. Uh, the only thing it had was it had a, a beautiful user interface. It's actually the best user interface I've ever used on a receiver. And honestly, one of the best UIs I've ever seen on a piece of home theater equipment. It was so fast, so easy to use, so easy to tweak the settings. The Room EQ stuff that it did was not impressive, and it, it really took uh, a lot of tweaking to get it right, but ultimately it just never, it, it, it never clicked for me, and I'm sitting here and I'm saying, I, I've got to A-B this thing, so I, I play a couple, I play a couple uh, Blu-ray discs, I play some two-channel music, and stuff like that, and then I immediately unhook it, and I hook up the Pioneer, and I said, you know what, the, this Pioneer receiver that I have actually sounds better. It had a, a warmer sound, it had a, it couldn't go as loud, and it, you know, the Pioneer just wasn't powerful enough for the room, so it was, I would really have to kind of crank it to 50 or 55 to get some real home theater performance, where the Yamaha was able to give more dynamic performance at lower volumes, which I liked. And had a whole bunch of different DSP settings, but I said for nine hundred bucks, I you know I got to return this thing. This is maybe I got a bad model, but especially the the center and and, and the surround channels weren't as strong. Now you may be saying, well, wait a minute, you said you didn't have surround channels. What I did is I finally bit the bullet. I, I talked about the room geometry in the last episode. And I said, you know, I really regret not being able to go back to a, a 5.1 setup like I had in the previous house. So I was just, I was looking around the room and, and I said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I have some old Polk Audio speakers, and I noticed they had like picture hooks on the back. And I didn't even notice that. I was like, oh, okay, so these things, and they're pretty heavy, they're about 10, 11 pound speakers, so these things are going to hang on the wall just with a nail. So I look around the room and I decide, you know, there's no way I'm going to get them wired through the ceiling. Uh, there's no way I'm going to get them really under under the carpet. I just don't feel like doing that. So let me put them on the sides. Now, when you have rear surround speakers, if you aren't doing side channel, rear, rear channel, you're really supposed to have the, the rear channel, what you're using is your rear channel behind you. But... So, you know, let me, let me just try, let me hang them on the walls. You know, essentially, and it's not even quite even, the walls aren't quite symmetrical in that way, but they're more or less on both sides of my head. And, uh, you know, like I said, with the Yamaha, it didn't seem good at all, really. But the Pioneer actually did a better job with even that. So, I return it, and I'm like, okay, I, I've got a got to find the right receiver. I order an Ankyo something or other, 747 NRTX 747, I think, and uh, Amazon just pissed me off because I, uh, I, you know, they said, Amazon, first of all, their shipping 
has gone has gotten insane. Really, they you know it used to be you get twenty five dollars free shipping. Now it's fifty dollars, and if you're not a Prime member, their two day shipping has become insane. But I was like, you know what? Whatever. I've got time on the weekend. Uh, on this couple weekends ago, let me just pay for the two day shipping. It'll get there on Friday, and I'll be able to tinker around with this because during the week I just I just don't have time. So, of course, it doesn't come. So now I'm furious with Amazon. And I've called them out on this on a number of different occasions. I actually got a fair bit of money back from them on on shipping. When they don't get things here, they will actually uh, refund the shippings. But anyway, I don't even open this on Kia. I just say, hey, delivered late, take it back to uh, the shipping center, and off it goes. So that was actually very fortuitous because as I was searching around, I said, well, you know, I already said I was going to spend like a thousand bucks on the receiver. But I wasn't convinced about other receivers in that $1,000 price range. I couldn't find quite find anything that I liked. Uh, the Onkyo, actually the newer model than the one that I had bought, actually got worse ratings, and a lot of people said it was actually much worse than what I had purchased. So I was like, okay, so I'm not going to get an Onkyo. I'm not crazy about the Marantz. So I, found my, I find my way to Denon. And I take a chance on the Denon, let's see if I get this right, it's the X4200, AVR X4200W, and it's kind of their top of the mid-range. And I figure, you know, let me, let me try this out. It's uh, about uh, 150 bucks cheaper than the, the Yamaha, and it's got 125 watts. So let's pretty powerful and I, I get it home first of all very easy to set up logically arranged and it, it you know it has a lot of the features that I think is you know I hate to say that you got to pay that much for a receiver but if you pay between the six and nine hundred dollar range you're gonna get two sort of separate circuit sub uh, subwoofer ports which is nice because you can expand you can go dual subs if you want to it's uh, I think it's a seven channel expandable to nine channel if you add a an amp and actually it has pre outs for all 7.1 channels. So if I were to ever move or get a bigger room, I could actually I think this is so important hook it, uh, hook it into an external amp and get different speakers, tougher speakers to drive, and it, it really gives you a tremendous amount of expansion. Meaning that you don't have to buy a receiver for a long time. And I've never had that, and I always felt bad about that, because that was one feature that I really wanted, even if I wasn't going to uh, to do that anytime soon. Also, very easy to wire. Unlike other receivers that sort of put the, the terminals in sort of one cramped area, they're just in a straight line across the bottom, so very, very easy to wire up. I do the bare wire mode, so I appreciate that. I know some people say, oh, you got to use banana plugs. And there's some people that says, no, say, no, you can't use banana plugs. It's You're putting more interference if you do it. So whatever. I just use regular bare wire. And the whole system sounds so much better. As soon as I turn this on, this thing has nice, warm, resonant sound. It can go really, really loud. It's got a great room equalization feature that got the, the speakers sounding as good as any receiver that I've tried. And like I said, I had a couple of pioneers and, and then the Yamaha. I mean, killed the Yamaha as far as what the actual calculations, what the actual EQ program does. Now, the Yamaha has a, had a much better interface, easier to use interface. The Denon user interface is cheap. The remote is cheap, but the actual hardware inside... Uh, very capable, and this Room EQ algorithm, whatever they use, uh, really did it just a a, a great job. Um, the other thing it does that I, I really like is, like the Yamaha, it has that sort of dynamic range at lower volumes, which if you're into the physics of all of this stuff, if you're an a AV guy, you're going to say, well, that's just compression. Yes, it's compression, but if you don't want to disturb people in the next room or whatever, or you're listening to something late at night, uh, you know, you don't want to rock the floor for the people downstairs if you're in an apartment complex, something like that. This does the best job I've seen on a receiver 
of preserving the theater surround sound effect at very moderate volumes, where if, even if I just walked into the other part of the house, the only thing I was hearing was really the, the subwoofer notes, and, and you can actually tell it to filter the exact subwoofer frequencies that will rattle walls or travel through walls. So it really gives you, and I like that, it gives you the ability to kind of enjoy the you know good sounding music and movies in a variety of different circumstances. So uh, that was absolutely incredible. The games, uh, obviously I said, you know, if you have the, first of all, just adding those two surround speakers, even though they're not perfectly placed, Really, it's so good to go back to that for gaming. And I, I stressed it in the last episode. I'll stress it in this episode. If you can do true, discrete surround sound and, and get those speakers near the back somehow, uh, it's really worth it. I'm glad I took the chance and just drilled some holes in the wall and gave it a shot uh, because it's worked out really well. Now, the other thing that this receiver has is Dolby Atmos and DTSX. Now, what uh, these formats are is basically the object-based surround sound where you can, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the, the technical things, but basically what they want you to do is put speakers in the ceiling and, you, you know, it can, the sound will sort of track across all of your speakers and kind of put you in a bubble of sound. So I've always thought that was cool. My room set up with the the high ceilings and the skylights, stuff like that. I was never going to mount uh, speakers in the ceiling. And the people who had this place before me uh, did something really magnificent. I, I, I can't imagine why you would choose to do this, but they took these normal nine-foot ceilings in the where I have my, my home theater, uh, and they decided to remove, or, you know, they were normal ceilings, normal ceilings elsewhere in the house, but in this particular room they decided to turn it into a popcorn ceiling that sparkles. So, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I haven't have the skill, uh, or even the desire to sand all of that down. It's going to be such a mess. So I have this lovely sheen, uh, on my ceilings, but I, I can't get speakers in there and I, I'm not going to knock all of that junk down. So that's disappointing, but, what I did was I went out and I bought the Dolby enabled speaker. This is the speaker you may have seen that kind of sits on top of your front speakers and tries to create the height channel. And the real AV guys out there will tell you that that's bullshit and it doesn't work and, and the physics behind it, you know, just, it can't work. Well, it's very interesting. These things, I got them, they were fairly expensive when they came out. Some of the premium speaker companies were charging you, you know, three fifty a pair, two fifty a pair. I went with the Pioneer ones, which were supposedly the best ones. They started at two hundred a pair, but I got them for a hundred. So I figured for a hundred bucks, let me give it a shot. It's easy, wire up, just put them on top of my speakers, plug them in, see what happens. And I have to say, for a hundred bucks, these are not bad. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that they are as good as they are. Now, I'm going to preface that by saying they, it is a lie that they will place sound above your head. Uh, I, I, I don't really have that feeling consistently. It's not like in a movie theater when they have you know two rows of eight discrete speakers above you. It is not that. They were hyping that. It That doesn't work. But it does create what I'll call an elevated soundstage. And for a hundred bucks, that's not a bad thing to have. In fact, uh, very surprised with the effect that uh, it gives to classical music, where you have, you know, the, the, the string instruments sound more dynamic, um, which surprised me. I Because I usually, when I, I do, I'm not going to call it critical listening, but... When I do listen to music, and I don't listen to music that often, you know, I will just set it to two-channel stereo because I have some pretty good front speakers. But I have to say that these two Atmos modules plus 
the rear sur- or the side surrounds with classical music is really impressive. Uh, also with techno, because you know what these speakers are doing is they're shooting the the higher frequencies into the air, and so it it, it does elevate the sound stage a bit. Now what this receiver will do, which I really liked, is it will kind of up convert uh, Dolby and, and DTS tracks to a, an elevated, you know, what they call a, a, a height or front presence channel. So if you have these plugged in, it will take a track that wasn't Atmos enabled and it will allow you to kind of get that experience. Now this actually proved to be very good for video games. Uh, I was playing in anticipation of Horizon 3. I was playing Horizon 2. And this definitely changed the sound dynamics of the game. If I was driving through a field or I was kicking up gravel, yeah, the the gravel particles weren't flying over my head like the literature claims that they would. But it, it did give me more of a three-dimensional sound space to it. So, for a hundred bucks, I actually thought that was worth it. Now, with movies, actually the movie thing is silly. Basically, there were a wave of initial releases, uh, Dolby Atmos content on Blu-ray, but then it struck the geniuses at Hollywood to say, well, hold on, we're trying to sell 4K, so we're only going to put the Atmos track on 4K uh, Blu-rays, even though any Blu-ray player, as long as it can send out Bitstream, can can just send out the Atmos uh, metadata, I guess it is, and, and, and play it over an enabled speaker. So that's complete bullshit. But I tried some of the... I tried two movies, and believe me, they're not many. There's just a handful of them, and supposedly the best one is Transformers. I don't even know which Transformers it is, but a recent Transformers... Uh, in a movie called Everest. And it's pretty interesting what they, you know, the the comparison between the two. Now, Transformers uh, was, I mean, I, I couldn't even watch this thing. I was I was just sort of skipping to what I thought were the action scenes. And, and it really does, you know, again, it's, are things flying over my head? No, but I would say they're floating above my traditional soundstage. And you could hear, like, when the truck thing transforms into these little metal particles and it sort of reassembles itself on the other side of the road. You could actually, in the space of the room, hear, I'm not going to say each individual particle, but a number of individual particles move seamlessly from speaker to speaker uh, through the room. And you sort of have that with explosions and the... You know, the different, as as a transformer would sort of run from one part of the screen to the other in the process of transfor- transforming, you could kind of hear that sort of metallic clang move across the room. So Atmos, while not really placing anything truly above my head, was able, at least the codec was able to slightly improve upon whatever the, you know, DTSMA decoding, which is on most receivers. And DTSMA is very good, but this is slightly better. Uh, the other movie, uh, this Everest movie, was kind of interesting. It showed you kind of the atmospheric uh, effect, and, and actually this movie kind of came close to that bubble of sound idea. It's sort of a on-the-mountain disaster sort of movie, and as a storm comes in, uh, I, I felt this was somewhat dependent on room placement, like if I lean slightly forward into the sound field, I got more of the effect. Again, these speakers are kind of on the side of my head, but if, if I just sort of scooted up in the room and got my head sort of slightly in front of those speakers, and then I, f- I found myself in kind of a, a sound bubble, and you could kind of hear the uh, the snow sort of moving around you and, and how the storm was, was passing through the scene. Uh, it subtle. I mean, it's certainly not crazy, but it was a nice effect. Uh, that and, and the bass frequencies are, I think, a lot, not a lot stronger, but I would say noticeably stronger with Atmos. Uh, so I would have to say for a hundred bucks, uh, it's a, just sort of a garnish on my system, which is an okay system, but it adds a little something, and actually, if, you know, I don't buy a ton of DVDs, but if 
they really cared about getting this into people's hands, you know, I would look for Atmos enabled stuff just to to kind of get that slightly more dynamic sound feel. Now, I'm doubt I'm going to be in a position to ever have a d truly dedicated home theater where I can put stuff in the ceiling. But until that point, this is an okay solution. I mean, they're trying to phase it out. They're coming out with, you know, I think people realize that they lied about its true, you know, what they said it was going to do. But it, again, it's not all bad uh, if you go into it with uh, realistic expectations. Now, there's a competing format called DTSX, which does the same thing, but it doesn't require you to buy special speakers and, and will just deal with whatever speaker placement you have, but I think even less films have this DTSX. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that this is, if, if you have one of these enabled speakers and maybe the Pioneer things will drop to like 50 bucks for Christmas, try it out. I mean, it, it may vary based on the receivers. I was posting about this in one of the AV forums and uh, someone told me that, well, you know, the Denon, whatever program they use, the Odyssey Room EQ program will kind of match those speakers better than some other receivers. You know, who, who knows? I think for 50 to 100 bucks, worth a try. Maybe you'll get a better sound experience out of it. The last thing I'll say uh, about the rec receiver and about this whole upgrade process was I was shocked at how hot this thing ran. So I had to actually uh, pick up two 120 millimeter uh, USB powered laptop or you know PC fans and sort of attach them to the to the side of this thing, and now I'm at a sort of comfortable 26C, uh, whereas it was like 4042 uh, before that. So if you're gonna get one of these higher end receivers. As my friend who's into home theater pointed out, he's like, well, what do you expect? You know, once, once you start upping, you know, you're going into the, the higher price ranges, there's more power, more stuff going on, the things run incredibly hot. So, worth noting, but yeah, I want to say that I think I'm done now. I, I think I've gotten certainly the video game performance that I want. By the way, they could ever get Atmos into video games, I mean, it would be brilliant for video games, even in just in this, you know, put speaker on top of speaker format, just to to have that ability to, to get the sort of bullet sounds across the screen, stuff like that. I actually think there's potential there, but yeah, I think for, for gaming, it's where I want it to be. Um, you know, not a big movie guy, but I think definitely for movies, it's where I want it to be, and I know that if I click off that... Uh, whatever they call dynamic volume, that sort of uh, dynamic range compression, and if I've ever gotten to a bigger room, uh, this thing could tear it down. I, I, I do think as far as medium-sized rooms, this is uh, a nice amount of power to have. Um, I've got the expandability uh, for, for the future, so I'm not really sure what more of an upgrade I can do, although, again, you always get the bug. Maybe you swap out speakers here or there, but... Uh, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make uh, now through two segments is don't neglect home theater. I think if, especially with more modern games, I shouldn't even say that because I, I talked about doing my sort of uh, two-speaker uh, old Pioneer receiver setup and, and hooking in all of my old consoles to it. Uh, that's also worth it. And if you go on eBay, you'll find a million of these old receivers with a million different old school inputs and you can do a retro gaming center like that. But with the newer stuff, uh, I do think it's worth it. I think it's overlooked. I, I think you want to move away from sound bars. You want to move away from all that Bose nonsense and, you know, really consider if you're looking for that upgrade, if, if you get into a, a point where, ah, uh, there's no real new systems to buy. Of course, now with the Neo and Scorpio and the new Nintendo system, we're not there, but whatever. If you have some, uh, money to throw at a video game setup and and you want to take it to that next level don't don't neglect home theater i i, I was talking to a friend of mine who uh never really got into it and i said look you know you you guys are movie watchers you know you're a gamer it's the guy i play the madden with and stuff like that uh you know try it out i mean there's what, what do you have to lose you're listening to to these video games through two tinny speakers um and, you know, when he's over, he's like, oh, this this really does make a difference. So uh, you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to 
spend thousands of dollars. Uh, even actually for video games, you can get by with a home theater in a box. You can get by with, with some of the mid to low range stuff and be really, really satisfied. So, uh, yeah, home theater for video games, uh, definitely worth considering. And uh, if you're into it as a hobby, it's a hobby that will suck away a lot of money and a lot of time. So the Retro League 1991 tournament continues, and let's take a look at the round one results. Some of these are pretty surprising, and, and I've, I really do have a problem with some of them. Uh, and then we'll move on, and I'll uh, vote in round two here. So round one, first we had Sonic the Hedgehog winning 90% to 9%, roughly, I'll... I'll just to use the round numbers here, uh, against Ease on the Sega Genesis. Again, I, I supported that because you could vote for Ease later on. Um, five and six, uh, Toe Jam and Earl losing, and I, I had voted for Toe Jam and Earl. They lost uh, 48%, almost 49% to Road Rash, getting 51%. Streets of Rage, destroying Outrun, as should be expected, 82% to 17%. Wonder Boy in Monster World, uh, 56, almost 57% over Quackshot, starring Donald Duck, getting a respectable 43%. Kind of surprised about that. Turbo Graphics, uh, Bonk's Revenge, uh, beating Bomberman 57 to 42. Now, uh, that game, uh, Bomberman, I should say, that sort of had a late push because Bonk's uh, Revenge really was. Uh, dominating kind of in the early stages of voting. So I voted for Box Revenge, but I'm happy to see that Bomberman got some love there at the end. Kadash, 53 to 46 over Sherlock Holmes. Ease, 66 uh, to 33 over Tailspin. And Turrican, 66, uh, almost 67%, to 33 percent for Parasol Stars, and I voted for Parasol Stars just because I had more fun with it back in the day. I always thought Turrican was incredibly difficult, but I guess a lot of people have some fond memories of the game. I, I kind of prefer the Genesis version of it, but nonetheless, the Arcade Brackets and Street Fighter, 90% to 10% over Total Carnage, Sunset uh, Riders losing out, to Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, 73% for Turtles in Time, to 26% for Sunset Riders. Kind of surprised it was so lopsided. I think Sunset Riders is a wonderful game. Uh, just unfortunate the way it fell here in the brackets. Uh, the Simpsons, destroying WrestleFest, 83% to 16%. And this next one I'm, I'm shocked by, Terminator... Two, the arcade game, 64 to 35% over Terminator 2 Pinball. Now, this is unfortunate. I, I think what happened here is that a lot of people remember the, the experience that the T2 arcade cabinet was. Like I said, visceral game, the two machine guns, the recoil, uh, the great sound effects. It was one of the iconic arcade experiences back in the day, but the Terminator 2 Pinball is just a masterful 
Williams pinball game. I don't know who created it, if it was Steve Ritchie or something, but it was one of the best examples of an incredible run for Williams pinball in the, I would say, starting in about 90 with Funhouse and then moving through to Mars Attacks, which I think, I don't know when that was, 95, 96. Uh, just tremendous work. So I think this is a case of the pinball prejudice, of which I've been guilty my whole life. I always gravitated to video games rather than pinball machines. But I think in this case, Terminator 2 Pinball was slighted. Uh, PC and Mac Bracket. Again, I had very little to no experience with these games. Uh, Monkey Island 2, beating out Commander Keen, 64-37. to Um... It looks like... This is interesting here. It, I guess they, they, they must have made a mistake. Um, oh no, here we go. Wing Commander 2, uh, almost 80% to Willie Beamish, Adventures of Willie Beamish at 25%. Chessmaster 3000, losing out to the Lemmings, uh, which uh, Lemmings got 50%. To the chess masters, 20%. Yeah, I think there's some issues here. Then we have Duke Nukem there at the bottom. Oh, no, no. It was 79% wing commander, 20% for chess master. And then Lemmings 50 to 49 over Duke Nukem. Moving on to the Super Nintendo bracket. Uh, no surprise here. Mario World, 96% over UN Squadron. I think that's, again, is as it should be. This next one, um, Super Castlevania 4 dominating F-Zero 64 to 35. Now, I have a problem with that. I think F-Zero, I mean, Castlevania 4 is a wonderful game, but it's not the best in the series, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's probably somewhere between, for I think a lot of people, Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night. I fall in the Symphony of the Night category. F-Zero, one of the greatest launch titles of all time. Uh, just a technical masterpiece that still plays amazingly today. Not to say that Castlevania doesn't, but I don't know. I, I think that it, it at least should have been closer. Then we have, let's see here, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, 62, almost 63% to Sim Cities, 37%. I would agree with that. Final Fantasy 2, 63% uh, to R-Types, 36%. NES bracket, Tecmo Super Bowl, 60-39 to 39 over Batman Return of the Joker. Battletoads, 88-22, to 22, uh, excuse me, 25, over High Speed. Uh, then we have Ninja Gaiden, 3, beating out... Tiny Toon Adventures, so pretty good there. Game Boy Bracket, Metroid 2, 93 to 6 over Faceball 2000. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, back from the sewers, 56, uh, almost 57% over Kid Icarus at 43%. That's kind of surprising. You know, I have to go back and play this game because I... I either had it or I borrowed it, and it was okay, but I mean, I would take Kid Icarus over that one any day of the week. Uh, Mega Man, Dr. Wily's Revenge, 50-49, to 49, just eking out a uh, victory over Operation C, and then Castlevania 2, 52-47 to 47 over Final Fantasy Adventure. I voted for Final Fantasy Adventure, but yeah, I could see Castlevania 2 winning. Then the wild card bracket, Golden Axe Warrior over Castle of Illusion. I voted for Castle of Illusion it's because I had it. I've never played Golden Axe Warrior, but that's that, I think that's the RPG. So, be nice to give it a shot. Score on that one, 63-36. to 36. Shinobi, 60-39 to 39 over Ninja Gaiden on the Atari Lynx. Sonic the Hedgehog on the Master System, almost 70% to 30% over Sonic the Hedgehog on the Game Gear. Again, I thought they were the same game. I'll have to take a, a closer look at them and, and, and see what's different. And then, 
Uh, out of this world on the Amiga, 75 to 25 over Stunrunner on the Atari Lynx. So those are your results. Now let's look at the matchups here in round two. So the first matchup we have is Sonic the Hedgehog versus Road Rash. And as much as I liked Road Rash for all the reasons I explained in the last episode, I think Sonic the Hedgehog is the clear winner. Uh, next, we have Streets of Rage versus Wonder Boy and Monster World. And I really like both games. I've, uh, I have both games here. I still return to them from time to time. Again, when I think of Streets of Rage, I always think of Streets of Rage 2 as, as being the, the high point, and 1 as an appetizer. Of course, there have been a lot of Wonder Boy games. I mean, I'm almost tempted to say Wonder Boy and Monster World is the best, but I, I can't... I don't know. I have to go with Streets of Rage. It's just... I would say I've had slightly more fun with that overall, even though uh, Wonder Boy and Monster World is a gem. Bonk's Revenge versus Kadash. Like I said, I Kadash was decent. I always preferred it in the arcade. Bonk's Revenge, uh, a favorite of mine, so I'm going to go with that. Then we have Turrican versus Ease 3, and I will go with Ease 3 again, because I, I think Ease 3 is a, is a great game, and... Uh, I like the Genesis version, but I think it is a game that you associate with the Turbo Graphics, and I'd like to see it go far. I, I think Turrican, again, very difficult and not the best in the series, uh, even though it was iconic and a game that I played a lot because I did have it. I just think got to give East Three some love. Street Fighter 2 versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time. I think this is going to be closer than a lot of people think because we have kind of the the first, I mean, obviously you have the original Street Fighter. I would argue that that was a significantly different game to Street Fighter 2. So I think Street Fighter 2, the first in the classic Capcom fighting game series that dominated the 90s versus... Uh, the high point of the Ninja Turtles game, so I could I could see a lot of people going with Turtles in Time, arguably the high point of the whole Konami beat 'em up genre. Even though I kind of give that to the Simpsons personally, nonetheless, I think here you have to go with historical significance, and even in its own time, Street Fighter Two was generating. Lines of people to play. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was not. So I'm going to go with Street Fighter 2. Again, I think it's one of the best arcade games of all time. Simpsons versus Terminator 2. Again, a battle of iconic arcade experiences. And I'm going to go with The Simpsons again because I think it is the best Konami beat em up. I think it's visually one of the most impressive accomplishments uh, of the arcade. And I think overall, just a more fun game to play. Uh, Monkey Island 2 versus Out of This World. Again, no experience with these games. I voted for Out of This World based on some footage I saw of it. It looks like an interesting sci-fi type game, so I'll go with that. Wing Commander 2 versus The Lemmings. Again, very limited experience. I played Wing Commander 2 at a friend's house. I'll go with that. Super Mario World versus Castlevania 4. I, I suspect a lot of the, the Castlevania people are going to go crazy here and really try to put Super Castlevania over Super Mario World. It's one of the problems with this tournament is uh, anyone can vote, of course, which, I mean, that's not an inherent problem in and of itself. And you can only vote once, but I think when when fanboys hear that this is going on, they sort of rush in and will vote up a title uh, over another. I think in the history of games, uh, I, I don't think you can you can put Super Castlevania 4 over Super Mario World, so I'll go with that. Final Fantasy 2 versus Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Again, I liked Final Fantasy 2. Uh, I think Super Ghouls and Ghosts is probably going to win, but for my purposes, I just had more fun with Final Fantasy 2. 
Tecmo Bowl versus Shatterhand. To me, a Tecmo Super Bowl rather versus Shatterhand. Tecmo Super Bowl all the way. Uh, I, that's, I I don't think you can uh, overstate how big of a game that was in in just announcing Nintendo to a wider audience. Battletoads versus Ninja Gaiden, two very difficult games. I always preferred Battletoads. We move on to the Game Boy here. Metroid 2 versus Back from the Sewers. Uh, I have to go with Metroid 2. I'll be curious to see if, if people vote up Back from the Sewers, but Metroid 2 was excellent on the Game Boy. I mean, if you go back, and again, it was one of those experiences where you were playing Metroid you know, Metroid on the NES, and to just shrink that down and have it in your hand in the car was incredible. Uh, Mega Man versus Castlevania 2. I'm going to vote for Castlevania 2 here, because even though I voted against it, uh, because I liked Final Fantasy Adventure better, I think as far as uh, a good side-scrolling game, Mega Man's good, but I always thought, I always liked Castlevania 2. So I'll go with that. Uh, Golden Axe Warrior versus Shinobi. Again, I've never played Golden Axe Warrior, uh, but I had Shinobi, and it was, as I mentioned in the last episode, very impressive, so I'm going to go with that. And Sonic the Hedgehog on the Master System versus Out of This World on the Amiga. I will easily take Sonic the Hedgehog on the Master System. Submit those votes. So... We will see how it plays out. In the end, actually, it's interesting. I submitted the vote, and uh, in the previous round, you could actually see the percentages uh, of people who had voted before, and so you could see where a game was standing. Now they took that away. I think that was smart because I think, you know, if people say, oh my God, you know, Game X is losing, uh, they'll try to get batches of people in to vote. So. There you have it, round two of the 1991 Retro League video game tournament. Again, go to theretroleague.com. You can vote in any round, even if you haven't signed up for the forums, even if you haven't voted in the previous round. You can go back and vote, and we'll see what the best game of 91 is, probably by the end of September. All right, let's move on in the tournament, and we're going to go over the round three results now. Uh, I didn't actually vote live on the round three results, but we had Sonic the Hedgehog going up against Streets of Rage. Uh, surprisingly close. It was Sonic the Hedgehog edging out Streets of Rage 54 to 45. Again, I think that's a lot closer than people would have suspected. I think the Streets of Rage franchise over the years has become rightly appreciated for how great it was on the Genesis and Sonic has been knocked down a few pegs. I think a lot of people, again, don't consider it to be a great uh, platforming game, but in this case, Sonic the Hedgehog, the initial game, was iconic. It moved on. Bonk's Revenge, crushing Eve's 3, 60, about 62% to 38%, uh, just under 60, uh, 62%. Pretty surprised there, because I think, it, again, Ease is another game that benefits a lot from hindsight, but Bonk's Revenge, again, I think rightly was an excellent game for its time, and Ease 3 honestly deviated from what made the first uh, two Ease games great, so I could see Bonk's Revenge going ahead. Street Fighter 2 versus The Simpsons, again, uh, a fairly handy victory by Street Fighter 2, 67 to 32. Percent kind of surprised that The Simpsons didn't get some more votes. But again, uh, Street Fighter 2 is one of the best games of all time. Out of This World, edged out Wing Commander. Again, I can't really comment on that. 57 and a few percentage points to 42. Super Mario World, uh, 70% to 30% over Final Fantasy 2. Shockingly, and I'm I'm very surprised by this. Tecmo Super Bowl losing out to Battletoads, and I think this is the the anti sports prejudice coming through. Battletoads was a very impressive game, but very very difficult. And I think this vote kind of neglects 
how much of an impact the Tecmo Bowl and Tecmo Super Bowl made on its generation. So uh, it was close, 52.17% to 47.83%. But again, I, I think that's uh, a slight miscarriage of justice. I think Tecmo Super Bowl should have won. Moving on to the Game Boy brackets. Uh, the Game Boy champion, as it were, Metroid 2. Very easy win over Castlevania 2. And the wild card bracket, uh, Golden Axe Warrior. Uh, this must be a wonderful game. I, I really have to check it out. Uh, Crushing Sonic the Hedgehog game. We have another Sonic game on the board, so maybe that has something to do with it. But I really need to hunt down a ROM of Golden Axe Warrior. I believe the actual game is quite expensive, and my Game Gear screen is pretty bad. So now we're going to go back... Or go back. Then we're going to move on to at least my live voting for the quarterfinals here. And we have Sonic the Hedgehog versus Bonk's Revenge. And I'm, I'm going to have to push Sonic through for all the reasons that I've been giving. I think Bonk's Revenge was a wonderful game. Sonic the Hedgehog for the Genesis was iconic insofar as it felt like a truly new platformer. It started the whole competition between Sega and Nintendo. Uh, it, it just was so representative of that era. So for that reason, I'm going to go with Sonic the Hedgehog, although Box Revenge, you might argue, is a, a more technical and challenging game. Street Fighter 2 versus Out of This World. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not even commenting on Street Fighter 2. I think this is a, it's been a clear win in every bracket. That it's been in Super Mario World versus Battletoads. You've got to give it to Super Mario World, uh, a more fully realized platformer. And Metroid 2 versus Golden Axe Warrior. Golden Axe Warrior might take this. I, I can't vote for Golden Axe Warrior because I have not played it and I honestly haven't had time, as I've said, to hunt down the ROM. But I do have fond memories of Metroid 2. So I will submit my vote, see what happens here, because I give you a running total. Uh, as of now, it seems like my picks are dead on. Uh, although very few, uh, I shouldn't say very few people have voted. Uh, there there are quite some votes uh, registered, between 50 and 60 votes registered, so go to the Retro League Tournament, we'll see what happens. Semi-finals and finals coming up, It uh, it has been fun. And the question is, if these results hold, if my picks hold, you're going to have Sonic vs. Street Fighter 2, Super Mario World vs. Metroid 2, and it's going to be very hard, and, and in upcoming segments I'll, I'll break down you know, which of these games really deserves the title of Best Game of 1991. I think in each case you can make a very strong argument uh, for each one. So that will be interesting, but it looks like voting on this round is going to head through till September 24th. Uh, by the time you guys listen to this, uh, that date will likely be long past. But in any event, you should probably just check out the RetroLeague.com. Good podcast, interesting information, and uh, we want to keep this tournament going. Well, the Retro League tournament is now winding down. I've gone through so many of the brackets, and we are now at the semi-final brackets, and we have four games. Street Fighter II, Super Mario World, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Metroid 2. And the matchups are uh, Sonic the Hedgehog versus Street Fighter 2, and Super Mario World versus Metroid 2. Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, obviously. Now, I'm going to end my coverage here. I'm not going to go on and do any kind of uh, analysis of the final matchup. I'm not going to let you know who won. Go over there and figure it out. And I'm not going to, and I'm, I'm doing that only because I think these four games could win. And they each present strong arguments for being the best game of 1991, and I want to examine those arguments, give you my thought, and then we'll just see how it plays out. So I'm going to start with what might seem to be the ostensible underdog here, and that's Metroid 2. Now, Metroid 2 is a very good game. It's a very solid representation 
of what Metroid was on the NES. And I have not played it in a long time, as I've mentioned in some of the other segments that I've done uh, on the this uh, tournament, but what I took away from it, even back in the day, was that this was, I think, personally, the first game that really gave you the impression that the Game Boy was something special. It was capable of rendering NES worlds. Now, that had always been the advertisement uh, approach to the Game Boy. It's, well, you're playing these great games at home, and now you can play them on the road. But I think even as kids, when we were playing that original Mario Land, when we were playing some of the like the early Double Dragons, uh, Blades of Steel, things like that, you got the sense that, oh yeah, I'm playing a Nintendo game, but I would rather go back to the Nintendo. And I think Metroid 2, at least for me, was the first game where I didn't say that. I said, you know what, this is a worthy sequel in its own right, and it's giving me a world in this little screen that, in some instances, in some ways, might be the rival or even have the potential to be better than what's on the NES. And there were a number of games to do that. I think the, the first Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy Adventure series, particularly 2 and 3, did that. I think certainly the Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was an example of a game that was so special and captured so much of Zelda so well. It was actually, I think if we take the pure nostalgic glasses off, better than anything that was on the NES. And then, of course, Pokemon, So, which I only discovered later, but it was, it was that ability to, to have a, a fully realized world in this little green screen. And Metroid 2 was the first game to do it, and of course... How could I possibly forget Super Mario World 2, which I think was the second game to do it. So that was quite an accomplishment for 91. Again, Mario Land uh, 2 was 92, and then all those other games came after. Legend of Zelda 93, Pokemon, I want to say 95. So I think it's a it's a worthy uh, challenger. Now, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really recall... Uh, Tons of, of minute detail about the game, only that I felt like I was doing all the same. I had all the same challenges, all the same abilities that I had in the original Metroid on the NES, which, yeah, I'm going to say wasn't my favorite series. I, I kind of rediscovered and, and got to appreciate Metroid really with Super Metroid, but it was um, it was special, and I, 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 did I own it? Or I, I think I, <laughs> I don't think I owned it. I think I, I had an extended borrow of it. If you remember back in the day, you would uh, lend a game out and things would happen and someone would move or you just kind of got lost in the shuffle and you never gave it back to a friend or you never got your game back. And so I, I had an extended borrowing session probably for about, let's say, when did I get my Game Boy? Well, I mean, I played it obviously at this friend's house who got all the latest stuff pretty quickly. But I, I got my Game Boy in uh, in 93, at, at the release of, of Zelda. So at that point, he had been tired of this game, and I asked to borrow it, and I got it for about a good year. A good year, two years. But hey, it was all fair. I mean, I lent out... I'm still waiting on games that I've lent out that I, I, I haven't gotten back uh, from the era that I probably never will get back. But, uh, yeah, so it was it was fun. Um, I, think, I do think it's the weakest game here, but I think if you want to say, hey, you know, video gaming, expanding it beyond the console and challenging the console and honestly challenging the arcade in the sense that, <laughs> the, you know, as far as a side scroll, that Metroid 2 was better than some bad arcade games. So the the ability to create quality games on a variety of platforms, and in this case on a handheld platform, and to be a destination game, I think from a technical standpoint, from uh, just a historical standpoint of when it re was released, what it was up against in its era, uh, I think you can make that argument that, that this is the best game in the group. But not being a huge Metroid fan or a super fan of Metroid, just someone who appreciates Metroid, I can't give it to Metroid 2. 
Uh, let's look at Super Mario World. Um, Super Mario World against it in the bracket. And obviously, what can I say about Super Mario World? I, I mean, everyone's played it. Everyone's loved, loved it. I, I, I don't know a single person who has said anything negative about the game. So I, I guess I'll, I'll just point out that I think this is the epitome of the 2D Mario genre, even to this day. I think it's better than Yoshi's Island. I think it's better than New Super Mario or whatever it was, you know, New Super Mario Wii U and everything like that. I think this is the best representation of the 2D Mario universe, if you will. And I think it just, from the release date in 91 until today, I think that's the case. It gets everything right. It advanced in all the right ways over Mario 3, and Mario 3 is a, is a great game. But this had a wow factor to it. It just exuded fun. I remember seeing it, like I said, in a, in a Bradley's, for those of you who are in the, in the Northeast, in that Super Nintendo display case with the little flat screen television and just feeling like, you know, just being wowed, just being, and I knew I wasn't going to get it for all the reasons I've talked about on this show and my, my interesting family situation with consoles, but I felt good. I felt positive about the hobby just by seeing this game. And, and when I played it at my, you know, there in the store at my cousin's house and it was an immense joy and it, it still is to this day. So I think you could do a top 10 of all time and, and this game would be a strong contender. So I would, I mean, obviously this could easily win. Uh, then we go to Sonic, and I've, I've talked about kind of the historical revisionism that goes into looking at the Sonic games. Obviously, this, the series has collapsed. I know they're trying to revive it with Mania and a couple other projects. But, yeah, the, 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 the series isn't what it once was. It was a primarily a 16-bit game that didn't translate well into 3D or whatever else they tried to do with it, with the exception of, like, the kart racing game and the tennis game or whatever. But Sonic, as I've said, it was a revelation. When you saw that game running at that speed, the color of the sprites, the size of the sprites, it, it really left an impact, and I think what people don't realize is it was a good game. It wasn't just... Uh, you know, a one-trick pony or something like that. I think it's unfair to say, well, it's all about speed. It, it had no precision. I mean, yeah, it was easier than its uh, competitors. It was easier than Mario. It was easier than Mega Man. But I think that was part of its appeal. I think it gave you a sense of speed and power that those games didn't, and that was unique. I also think it's incredibly well-designed. I mean, everything from, and you look at that first game, The Green Hill Zone, which was magical, just I remember playing, seeing that in uh, the Electronic Boutique, which uh, I know that still exists under the GameStop banner, but it wasn't GameStop back then. It was its own store, and I, I just remember they had set that up back in 90 or whenever, 89, 90, uh, when it came out, and I, and I felt like you know I was in a totally different uh, universe from the NES. I believe I, I mentioned this somewhere. I can't remember what podcast I mentioned it on. Could have been uh, just uh, within this tournament, but my parents rented the Genesis, and I, I played that game from like one Friday into Saturday. They only had rented at this local store for like a day or something. And man, I, I just I remember that so vividly. It was just an incredible experience going through that game and getting to the Starlight Zone and. I mean, really special. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, historically, I mean, it, uh, before I get to the historical aspect, yes, mechanically, I think it's inferior to all three of these games. But it was the game, historically, that launched the Nintendo Sega War, one of the most iconic times in the history of gaming. It was the game that created this very profitable industry. I mean, it wasn't just a one-company industry. It it announced 
to all these different companies, including Sony and, I mean, can you argue Microsoft? I don't know, but certainly Sony looking and saying, whoa, hey, wait a minute, there's some real competition uh, for consumer dollars. You know, let's get in, let's innovate. And, and this was the game that started all of that. So I think from that standpoint, it you can make that argument, and that is a, a powerful historical argument that you can't make for any of these games. I mean, not even close. This was... A, a, an industry-defining moment. And I think the entire hobby is better for it. So you can't discount that. And again, you can go look at uh, theretroleague.com and see how the voting is going. But I think the voting, at least as it's when I'm recording this and it's not over, I think the voting reflects that. I think Sonic is doing surprisingly well. And, and I think for the right reasons, that it's it's finally getting that appreciation that I think is a community we haven't given uh, the franchise, and particularly this game. And then you have Street Fighter 2. And I've talked at length about Street Fighter 2, but if I had to pull out one argument for why I think it is worthy here, I mean, yeah, it's a fighting game. It doesn't have the depth or at least the kind of linear narrative depth that these other games have, but it has the the technical depth, and it founded a genre. Now, again, that's an arguable point. Yes, there were other fighting games before it, I mean, obviously Street Fighter, but it was so well executed, and its vision of what a competitive arcade fighting game should be was so perfectly, obsessively defined in that game, that it, it created this genre that we're still enjoying today, Evo and, and all the rest of it. So, I, I, I've, you know, when I found it in the arcades, well, not in the arcades, as I said, I actually found it at a, a pool in this little shack. There were two games. One was Street Fighter 2, and I couldn't tell you what the other one was. That might have been a pinball. But playing it for the first time... I, I was intimidated. I was like, what What the hell am I supposed to be? This is kind of like Final Fight, but not... How are these older kids who are, you know, kicking me out of the way to play this game? How are they doing these moves? And so, it was a, a game that I felt like, in the days before the internet, that you had to really explore. I mean, there was a secret to it. There was a secret to acquiring the skill, and you kind of needed the mentorship almost of someone older than, a, than, than you to, to kind of tell you, um, especially before it came out for, like, uh, the Super Nintendo and the, and, and the Sega. Now, I realize, uh, looking back, that I, I want to say on some of those cabinets, I don't know if it was the first one or the Champions Edition one, they, they kind of showed you the joystick motions, and who knows why I didn't notice that or I couldn't pull it off or whatever, but my friends and I didn't see it or didn't take notice of it or didn't understand it or whatever the case was, and so it was just this mystery to us. How do you do all these great moves? And so it became, throughout the the 90s, certainly from 91 to 95, when I was really you know hitting up the arcades on a frequent basis, uh, it became a, a sport, it became a skill, it became a, a journey, really, to figure out how to play all of these characters. And... It's a, a situation that I think continues to this day, even though I, now I know how to play all these characters. I, I haven't, I still haven't mastered Zangief. I'm still not comfortable with Dalsim. I'm, I'm not a great, well, of course, you couldn't play Vega in those games. But that was something special, that, that continued sense of progression that you had. I mean, the hunt for, like I said, I, on one of those videos, I don't know if it was the Street Fighter video or the Nintendo Power video, where I actually came out and said, you know, I had to hunt down these magazines. I mean, if if you heard about some of the school said, oh, there's a magazine that tells you the move set. I mean, it was a big deal. And when you got it at home, of course, you learn the game a lot quicker and and things like that. But we're talking about the arcade game. So uh, I mentioned in the Street Fighter video also that it, it, it one of the best memories in gaming that I I've, I ever have that I'll. Uh, carry with me forever was that I was playing the original Street Fighter 2 in a pinball arcade. Uh, you know, they had a, a couple arcade machines and, and a ton of pinball things. So I'm playing it, I'm playing as Ken, and I'm, I'm going through the game, and I see 
this little kid next to me and he's kind of looking and he's enthralled at you know, how am I pulling off the moves and he's you know looking at uh, the motions of the joystick and you know he's of course too nervous to ask me anything or ask if he can play and you know that was me and and now I was the older kid uh, when I was a little kid I was you know in my late 20s at that point but you know so just seeing the fact that the game still had that sense of awe for a young kid these days who, you know, he had an iPhone in his pocket and uh, yet he he was, this game completely drew him in. And so I, which of course never happened to me, I was like, hey kid, you know, here, take, you know, play, play. I've got a couple credits left and enjoy. Uh, you know, back in when I was a kid, you know, and, and you were watching, they as I've said, they tell you to go fuck yourself. So I want to say that, uh, Hopefully, if that that kid got a, a, a lot more enjoyment and a, and a friendlier introduction to the series than I had, um, I think the other thing that is powerfully evident and, and and a great sort of representation of how great this game is is the fact that if you play it today, and this happened to me, I think I want to say about a year ago, a uh, buddy came in. I only see him once a year. He's a gamer, I mean, who was my sort of gaming friend uh, all throughout high school, and uh, he came into the game room, and at that point I had the X-Arcade dual joystick set up, he's like, oh, you you have Street Fighter, so we popped in the, the Capcom Collections version of Street Fighter, that same arcade game, we were playing it, and we were having a blast, and it felt like each game, and it still feels like each game that you play is different. Now, I realize that's not the case. Look, if you're an expert player and you've got the frames memorized and, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you put the computer on normal, you can kind of thrash them in every match. Every match is going to be the same. But when you play against that other human player, uh, each game feels different. And that, just on a theoretical level, is, I think, why we game. That sense of contingency, the sense that what we are doing is, each time we do it, is going to offer a different experience. It may have the same conditions, the same rules, but the pace, the, the kind of experience that we have within the game is subtly, or in some cases, extremely different and fun each time that we play it. Now, again, that's not my philosophical point. I want to believe I read that in a book called... Uh, Homo Ludens, uh, which is a famous book not on video games, but on kind of, you know, what makes a game a game. I um, forget who the author is, the Dutch guy. Anyway, you can look it up, Homo Ludens. And uh, I think that is, and you, of course we can argue, do video games really offer you a different experience or do they give you the illusion of contingency? And I think, to me, it doesn't matter. As, as long as you have, it's a, not if you have real uh, contingent action or the illusion thereof, but if you have that feeling, if you have the experience of that contingency, if you have the experience that each time you engage in this playful activity, uh, the outcomes will be, the outcomes are undetermined and different um, and enjoyable, I think that is kind of the, the high watermark of what it means to be a game. And I think Street Fighter, to this day, Street Fighter 2, uh, achieves that. And of course, if you you get into the Champions Edition, Super, Alpha, Alpha 2, I think Alpha 2 is the high point of the entire series. It obviously developed on this. But I don't think you can underestimate that. I mean, the, the fact that it feels fresh... And the fact that it founded a, a genre, a community that to this day exists. Of course, when the arcades collapsed, it collapsed, but it's come back. And I think we can trace all of that to Street Fighter 2. Not, you know, I mean, obviously, like I said, there are other games. There's SNK contributed to this as well. But I think it's Street Fighter 2 that set the... That, that let the world know that this is an amazing genre. So, for that reason, I would vote for Street Fighter 2. 
I think Mario, uh, you can make, again, a strong argument for its continued appeal, but I give it to Street Fighter on this, this sense of newness, the sense of freshness, this idea of contingency that I don't think Super Mario World has for as wonderful as it is and as much as I like going back to it. You know, there are, mem- I mean, I don't have the whole game memorized, but there are levels that I have memorized, and I can play them in the same way, time in and time out. And the only question is how quickly I could do it, or what is my level of skill, or as I get older, the deterioration of my skill. Uh, but but it's not offering me anything new. Where with Street Fighter, especially with that set, the, 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 a human player two, uh, offers you new and exciting and competitive experiences on, if you play it on a real machine, old hardware or, you know, old code as it were. So, uh, I think that, that, that needs to win, but again, you can vote for all four of these games and make a strong argument for why they were the best of 91. All right, I want to end the show talking about selling games and specifically selling a part of my game collection. Now, you may have noticed over the past couple of episodes that my mood and that my perspective on games is getting a little bit negative. And again, this is a retro critical podcast, so. I I like to, I, I don't I don't feel the need to be positive I don't I don't approach life thinking I need to maintain a positive attitude I, I like to to approach life with a sense of critical realism not to say that I don't enjoy things but I think we need uh, particularly if you live in the United States to uh, really uh, think uh, critically about the world around you and I've tried to take that approach with uh, the hobby that I love but even. That having been said, uh, even over the past, like I said, two, three months, I've, I, I think I've strayed beyond the sort of critical aspects of the podcast, and I've been um, somewhat, I, mean, I shouldn't even say on the podcast, but in just my general engagement with the hob- hobby, it's turned uh, from critical to somewhat negative, and I've been depressed. I've, I mean, not, not, not in life in general, but I've just been depressed with the hobby. And the intention of this segment isn't to really go into why that is. I, I may do that um, at another time. But, you know, and I've, I've had down times with gaming in the past, and I've, I've never kind of lost it, ultimately lost the passion. It's always come back, but I would say since uh, the summer, and I, I had some uh, some time to myself this summer, and yet I found that even in those moments that I had to myself, and I could have broken into the closet and played any number of games for as long as I wanted on these, uh, you know, for a couple nights here, a couple nights there, and and just generally lately, I I didn't do it. In fact, I've been... Uh, gaming very little, and I, I it's it's uh, it's not so much a work thing. Uh, it's just I I haven't I just haven't had the desire to do a lot of gaming. And of course, in this episode, I've been talking a lot about Forza, and and, and I've been playing that now uh, recently uh, in the couple days before I released the podcast, but. Yeah, I just found that I wasn't turning on, I, I wasn't using the, the game room a lot, and uh, 
Anyway, I decided that I, you know, I always thought I would wait and let it pass. Well, it's been three or four months, and eventually I, I got to the point where I said, you know, let's see if I can put up some games for sale. Um, and I'm not doing it in a kind of, oh, I need to get rid of this stuff, I'm out of the hobby. No, I just wanted to find some games that I knew I wasn't going to play and test the waters. And I also wanted to put together a lot of games that I thought was unique and I, I thought had some real value and I, and I thought represented uh, some of my collecting goals over the past uh, six, seven years. So I went through the collection and uh, I pulled out a lot of sealed RPGs. Uh, a lot of them were for the, the PSP and for a couple of other systems, PS2, uh, Wii, primarily. And uh, then I mixed them in with some good retro games. I had uh, Moonwalker on the Genesis, all the Genesis Fantasy Star games. Uh, I put together a really nice grouping of some of the Japanese Saturn fighting games, including Street Fighter Alpha 3 is one of the, not really a jewel, but is kind of one of the ones that stand out in the collection, or I should say Zero Three, the Japanese version. I uh, put together some pretty good uh, Dreamcast games. I had Power Stone, Power Stone 2, Project Justice, Shenmue, and Grandia, and a bunch of other stuff. It came out to about 95 games, 45, I don't know, excuse me, 40 were sealed, and the other 55 were desirable and in very good condition. And I, I kind of did the sort of the mental calculus as to like, you know, all right, so I have these 40 sealed games. Some of them have been sealed for five, six years. I'm not going to play them. I, and now I just don't have the, the time to play them, especially these RPGs. And I, I've kind of, I don't want to say I've soured on the RPG genre because I, I do love it and I, and I love what it represents. And I actually love the experience of getting into an RPG, but I just find that the barrier to entry in some of these, particularly these later games, these games that have come out in from you know 2007 until right now, it's the the, the terrible tutorial, the the horrible voice acting. I have to say that I'm not as much as I love the art and the style of these games. Um, I'm tired of listening to the whiny anime voices and all of this. And just the system after system after system that you have to learn. This is why I love Bravely Default, by the way, because it sort of went, went back to the old school RPG style. It dispensed with all the nonsense, and it let you play the game as you wanted to play it. Anyway, I digress. So I put together a lot, and, and I was proud of this lot. And I said, you know, this is... Um, this is something that I think is going to give people real, <clears throat> excuse me, real value. And I, I put it up on eBay and Craigslist. So I mean, a couple of things were interesting. First, the kind of psychological aspect of committing yourself to pulling stuff out of your collection. You know, I've been amassing these games. My theory has always been, well, it doesn't matter if I don't play them now. These games kind of represent something that I'm interested in. And I've had countless occasions over the course of my collecting life where I would go into the collection and pull out a sealed game that I had and unseal it and play it and discover something, even if it was three or four years after the purchase. Well, um, I do believe that is a, a big part of having a video game collection. But nonetheless, I hadn't done it with these games, so I was pulling these out. And, and I love those Saturn fighting games, but... Ultimately, I looked at them, I said, you know, this, these things are pretty pricey, and for the the lot, I think to make the lot desirable, I had to add them in. Project Justice, I was so happy to get that, I, I, I love that game, but I haven't played it in a long time. So, you know, you do that thing where, okay, you know, okay, I haven't played this, is it really worth it, could I do something else with the money? So, it, it's, it's sad, it's, um, I don't know how to explain it, it's like taking off a piece of armor, almost, like I've built this collection and each link, each game on the shelf represented something about me, some area of my interest. And also, kind of, it, it's a 
timeline of sorts. Like, I, I have a fairly decent memory for when I bought this, what I was, where I was in my life at that point. And so it felt like I was disassembling a kind of physical manifestation of my life's chronology as I was pulling things off the shelf. But it didn't stop me. Um, so I, I, I did it, and then I had a little interesting interaction with the lovely people over at our, our retro, well, our, our game collecting. And of course, I think they're associated with our retro gaming. So I go over there and I say, look, I don't tell them what I have. I don't post pictures of it. I said, I'm trying to sell a lot of games. I don't particularly want to go the eBay route because I was, I think I mentioned when I was trying to sell my Oculus Rift, I had some issues uh, with uh, fraud. So I was like, you know, I'd rather do something else with this. So I said, look, I'm selling a lot. At this point, I hadn't priced it out. So I was like, oh, you know, it's probably, it might, might be a thousand bucks, might be 1500. I don't know, but it's not going to be just a, a lot that I'm going to sell for a hundred. So what do you guys recommend? And Honestly, I've stopped following those subreddits, and I've stopped following the the collecting market. Really, I, mean, I hadn't been on price charting, I hadn't been on eBay sold listings for forever. So I said, you know, is there a viable alternative? I'm just asking for advice, and they come back, oh, are you selling a lot? Come on, your your fucking NES cartridges aren't worth shit. So all you know, all this hate from these these guys. I was asking a legitimate question. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell them what I had, you know, they said my quote, one guy, you know, my dirty NES cartridges aren't, aren't worth anything or my, my commons. Maybe if I had new inbox complete games, maybe, well, Hey guys, I do. Okay. So anyway, uh, so I was arguing with them. Uh, I informed them that, uh, they're one of the reasons why I, I'm starting to dislike this hobby. Uh, so that didn't make them too happy. And then, the, you know, this idea that lots aren't the way to go. I mean, hold, hold on, guys. I have been around collecting for a while, and not just video game collecting. My father is an avid coin collector, so I spent time at coin shows. I kind of know how that market works. My best friend is a huge, video, uh, huge baseball card collector, so I've been around that market. And when you get into those, and I'm going to say it, more mature hobbies that have a certain longevity to them, what you will find is that when you have quality products, they are often sold in lots. And I've seen this at a coin show. It's actually pretty amusing. Uh, you know, whatever th people are into a particular series of coins. So whether it's the Silver Eagles, uh, whether it's um, the St. Gaudens Golden Eagles, which are like, <clears throat> you know, some of the, excuse me for my voice uh, breaking here and sniffling. I've had a cold and a sinus infection for weeks uh you know people are into this certain coins and these golden eagles are one of the hottest things so people will go and a guy uh, you know whatever a vendor or whatever they'll say oh you know i got the run from 27 to 33 or a lot of these the silver eagles hey i've got you know 88 to 2016 all uh, PCGS, you know, it's like the, the grading company. I've got them all in like top grades. And uh, I've seen people walk in, they've got a, a briefcase filled with cash, handcuffed to their arm, and they'll go and they'll make this deal. A friend of mine is this baseball card guy. Uh, he's got a lot of different collecting projects. Well, one of his projects was putting together every single set of top baseball cards, complete set. Um, ever made in unopened for kind of the newer stuff that doesn't have a lot of value per card to PSA four or five condition, which when you're talking about cards from the fifties is pretty good condition. So he put together that set and we're talking, you know, a closet full of this stuff. And, and of course, you know, when you're going from 79 back to 52, which is the first year that it was a top set, each single card was graded in a slab. So we're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of these slabbed cards. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to say what he was offered, but he basically put it on Craigslist and he was missing one card. 
And, and again, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to identify him too much. So I'm not going to tell you one card, what, which card he was missing. But if you're familiar with baseball cards, you will know which card he was missing. And uh, the offers coming in were incredibly at auction houses contacting him, buy the whole closet, stuff like that. Um, so this idea in video games that you can't have a lot is utterly absurd. Uh, I think actually, personally, if this hobby matures along the lines of some of these other uh, longer, you know, uh, more popular hobbies that have a bit of a history to them, you're going to find that lots, I think, are the way a lot of people go. And yeah, you can't have a lot of, hey, I've got uh, uh, WWF uh, Wrestling Challenge on the NES, uh, plus Double Dribble and a couple of other sports games. Yeah, of course those aren't going to draw the big money, but Complete Collections, for example. You don't think if a guy like John Hancock said, hey, I've got the entire run of Genesis games, and I'm putting it up there for... I don't know how much it would go for, 30, 40, 50 grand. There will be people interested. It's a very small market, but there will be people interested. Uh, there was a guy who I would say probably a year ago, two years ago, had the entire Turbo Graphics library plus all of the hardware up for sale. He wanted about 6500 Now, if I had had a lot of uh, spare income, I would have considered that because that's that's something that I would really like. The whole run of Turbo Graphics games, plus the CD games, plus all the hardware, 6500 buy it now, free shipping. Not bad. So what I try to do is I try to create an enticing lot of games. Yeah, 95 games isn't that much. You could go out and you could get all of them. But to have the combination of new in-box and great condition that I was offering was actually a value add to the lot. You know, I had taken the time to either get these games and leave them sealed or go out and sort of hunt down the best examples that I could at reasonable prices. So, so you're getting good quality. And if you're really serious and you like this genre, you like Japanese games, you like RPGs, uh, buying the lot would save you time. So I'm doing this not, uh, and I mentioned this in the post, look, I have no, fine, this is not a distress sale, I have no immediate need to get rid of these, I'm not crunched for space, I'm not expecting a child, I'm not having anyone move in with me, so I just uh, was putting it out there saying, you know, hey, is what is the interest? And I didn't name a price, I, I put it up on eBay for I put the max that I could put in, which was five grand, but I said, hey, I don't want five grand. I'm not asking for five grand. I don't expect five grand. Make me an offer. And on Craigslist, I basically said, look, you know, again, not in any sort of rush to get rid of these. Uh, I, I don't have a price in mind, and I really didn't. I, I knew what my cost basis was for this, and I knew what the eBay, current eBay values were, but, you know, on, on Craigslist, you don't necessarily expect to sell them for eBay prices. So I said, look, if you're serious, um, let me know. Contact me. And, and and people got back to me with some bullshit offers. And a couple people got back to me with uh, offers that were approaching serious. And I contacted a video game store just for my own amusement to see what they would pay. And I'm not going to name the store, but uh, they got back to me and said, oh, immediately. Like, And this was at, like, I posted this at on a Sunday night at 11.30, and uh, this uh, store got back to me like at, at 12, 15 a.m., you know, and, and they were, oh, we please, we're interested. Uh, you know, this is a great, this is a great lot. I mean, it's very rare that you see a lot like this, blah, blah, blah. So they then they say, but, you know, we here at X Video Game Store, and it wasn't GameStop, we here at X Video Game Store, you know, we need to, to make money on the things that we sell. So, you know, um, you're going to have to bring it in, but just know that, you know, we, we need to, to have some margin built in when we sell these things to keep the store going. And, uh, hey guys, I assume, I assume that. So I wrote back, yeah, I perfectly understand that that's the way your business operates. That tends to be the operating principle of a lot of retail businesses that you need to have a certain margin to, to have a business and to make money. Uh, I, I get the economics behind that. I said, however, um, 
I also have uh, certain uh, reasonable financial expectations for this lot. So if you guys are really interested to, to kind of calibrate where we are on this, why don't you make me an offer on 10 games? You know, the 10 games in this lot that you're interested in, uh, just make me an offer and we'll see. You know, we'll see if we have realistic expectations that we can work with each other. And then I'll be happy to drive every single game down to you and you can look at them uh, more closely and we can, you know, maybe have a deal. So I uh, didn't hear back from them, which tells you something. I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, predation out there. I think there's a lot of people who, and, and, and I'm going off a lot of the Craigslist offers, which of which there were, like I said, a couple ones that were approaching serious, and then a lot of people who were upset that I wasn't going to sell it to them for 200 300 bucks. Um, there's a There's a kind of predator mentality out there when you're selling these things, and so... Uh, you know, I, I obviously, it would take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money to, to sell these games individually on eBay. So yeah, I'm not looking for eBay prices. But again, there's some value uh, built into the way that this particular lot was curated that I think needs to be respected. So it's just kind of interesting to see where it goes. I think part of this is also experimental. And part of it was, uh, like I said, it, it was uh, an emotional challenge and it was distressing and also a bit cathartic at the same time that I could actually do this and I could make the sort of psychological commitment or at least the commitment to a willingness to part with these games. Um, but uh, we'll see. I think this is a side of the hobby that I've never seen. Not to say that I haven't. Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't really sold too many games. I've sold other things on eBay. I've sold uh, hardware and sort of like computer hardware and, um, you know, I've got a pretty good record of doing that on eBay, but uh, yeah, I've never sold games. I've never sold games of value. I mean, I have sold like PS4 stuff and, and new games that I didn't like and, and, and all of that. So we'll see where this goes. Like I said, at, at some point I'll, I'll, do a segment on why I'm depressed or hopefully do a segment on why I was depressed about the hobby and why I'm back into it. But yeah, I'm, I'm very curious. I, I'm almost tempted to do a YouTube video about the sale itself and say, Hey, you know, there's a couple of games are coming out. So, you know, let me know. Um, in any event, uh, that is it. We'll see where it goes. And, uh, hopefully I can, uh, you know, learn from this regardless of what happens, and I'll, of course, communicate how it goes. If I make the sale, I'll talk about the process here. Uh, if I don't, if I sort of recover from my uh, depression, I'll, I'll certainly let you guys know how that goes. But it's uh, it's interesting. It was, I think it's a, a reality that I think some of us are going to face, whether for family, hopefully not for medical or severe financial reasons, but I think at a certain point... Uh, you know, we're going to be confronted with, with selling this stuff, and I think there's probably a lot of information and a lot of considerations that you have to make for, for unloading a big game collection. So hopefully we can start the discussion here. It's episode 11 of the Retro Critical Podcast. A couple notes here at the end of the episode. I didn't want to do a whole segment on this, but I do want to acknowledge uh, this new Amazon Prime integration with Twitch. It's kind of interesting. I don't like Amazon Prime. I don't like Amazon, quite frankly. I think they have kind of reduced their level of service in order to get you into a Prime subscription. Um, that having been said, I, I think, and my, my hope is with this integration that actually, since you can get, give some free subscriptions to people, I think one, every 30 days you can 
subscribe to one Twitch person. I hope that this is the start, at least, of kind of recognizing the value that the individual streamers bring to the platform and kicking back some more money uh, to them. So I, I don't, it's not going to encourage me to get Prime. Um, I hate to say it, but I think it needs to be said, and why not, on the Retro Critical Podcast. It seems like one of the perks of Amazon Prime, one of the reasons why they get you to uh, sign up, or at least entice you to sign up, is the promise of all this content. The problem, a lot of the times, is that it's throwaway, it's throwaway content. The movies that you get for free are, you know, what was in the center of fucking Blockbuster back in the 90s. You know, I don't need to watch, I don't need to pay $99 a year to watch Bill Murray and Scrooged, okay? Uh, all the movies that you may want to see, all the new releases are still locked behind a paywall. Same thing with Prime, uh, Unlimited Kindle, or whatever the hell they call it. That, I've tried that, you know, you don't get the latest books, you get kind of a nice sort of collection of old books, I guess, but... You know, it's not like you get the hottest new stuff, new releases. I assume music is the same way. So I wonder if Amazon sees this as just another piece of throwaway content that they can toss on the pile or if there's going to be some serious uh, investment beyond just owning it as a business and letting Twitch turn a, a profit for them. I, I Again, I, I think Twitch did a bad job of promoting streamers, and I would argue paying them, even though I don't know the financial aspect of it. I just think, as I've talked about with YouTube, the, the business model is an exploitative one. So, and of course, Amazon is no stranger to uh, domination and exploitation. But my hope is that they kind of recognize the strong community that Twitch has built and gives you, you know, some way of either directing more financial support to these people or just supporting them directly and, uh, you know, putting some uh, some more money in their pockets. It's probably a fantasy on my part, but, uh, you know, I hope it works out. I, I don't have anything beyond that. I don't have anything controversial to say about it. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You know, as always... Uh, I thank people for the, the kind uh, notes on YouTube. Uh, but if you feel inclined to write something nice, uh, or not nice for that matter, uh, do it on iTunes so that uh, this podcast might uh, get recognized in the gaming category. Uh, so far, it hasn't. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see what the broader reception uh, of the podcast would be. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in doing that, I would appreciate it. Other news and notes, uh, I don't have too much other than to say that, again, uh, times have gotten a little bit busy uh, from a professional standpoint, and uh, I've got some side projects going on at, uh, at home, so I haven't been uh, that active as far as the podcast goes. It may not, you may not get another one until November, but I will try. Uh, you know, it also depends on the news cycle, too. I, I shouldn't say that you know, I think it's kind of slow towards the end of the summer, and I'm sure once the holiday season kicks in, there will be a lot of stories. Uh, I haven't been completely off of YouTube, though. I did, uh, if you're interested, and you're interested in a little political humor, I released a video under kind of my secondary channel, just under my name, William Cladley. It's called Translating Trump versus Hillary. I felt somewhat inspired after the first debate to do a little uh, commentary, and so I had this idea of, when I say translating, not into another language, but uh, translating the rhetoric into reality, and so having sort of subtitles uh, for what they really meant when they said what they said. Uh, the people who have watched it uh, thought it was humorous, but again, not getting all of that, not getting that much attention, but if you're interested, and and again, uh, it's uh, if you're particularly committed to either candidate, you probably <laughs> will not like it. But if uh, you have a kind of splenetic aversion to politics or these two politicians in general, uh, you may find it amusing. But beyond that, thanks for listening. This has been Retro Critical Podcast, Episode 11. <laughs>